We teach what we need to learn the most. One of the languages of the masculine, we speak the language of challenge. We thrive in challenge and overcoming challenge and the discipline that's involved in that and the confidence that's derived from that. We're not arrogant, confident. One of the greatest ways to know ourselves is to take ourselves to the edge. Who are we really? Whilst challenge is so deeply important, I think for all of us as human beings, reprieve and rest and space is equally as important. We, we've evolved this way. We've evolved with side-by-side -side brotherhood, exploring terrains that are unknown, extending the perimeter of what's been safe. You sometimes as an individual, we as individuals rely on those intimate bonds. And when we experience deep challenge and pain with each other and we, we live through that, man, there's something special that happens. It doesn't matter who you think you are, what your net worth is, you know, how serious you think you are, there's always room for fun. It became very clear to me that I was carrying my past, that I had shame around it. Our ability to receive is directly, directly, intimately connected with our self-worth. We have to feel safe enough in our own selves as men to be present. Uh, we, are, we are rapidly accelerating our technology, but is our morality accelerating? Yes, sister circles are great. Yes, men's gatherings are great. But coming together, men and women, it's absolutely necessary. And it's the way we're going. And we can't rush it. You know, it's funny, when I was about to say your name, I always pronounce it Stefanos, but whenever I hear your name from like Colin, it's a Stefanos. So what is it? Stefanos. Stefanos, yeah. okay. But it's, it's, it just rolls off a little better too, Stefanos, but it's a Stefanos. I just <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult, you know, it's, I was thinking about this the other day, because I was, um, I listened to a lot of um, uh, Sanskrit, because I listen to a lot of Vedanta, oh, right? Vedantic right. texts. Yeah. So yeah. he's constantly speaking in Sanskrit and then he'll say what is in English. And I like repeating because I just love the language. And I was thinking about languages and it's, I mean, it's easier in, in Britain and in Australia today, Stephanos. But here in the US, it's um, Stephanos or Stephanos. O's. Like it's the os is difficult for I don't know the American tongue. Yeah, okay. It's more challenging is what I've noticed. In Colin being just a fucking overachiever, he's like, I'm gonna nail it. I don't care where <laughs> I grew up. He's now a linguistic elite specialist. <laughs> <laughs> of course he is. Okay, if I grew up in southern Texas, I'm gonna fucking nail this. <laughs> in Sifandos? Did I get that one right? You did, or Sifandos. Sifandos. Yeah, Sifandos. So it's the accents are on different vowels. So you can say it both ways. Both, is, both are correct, yeah. So give it to me just both both together. I'll give it to my middle name as well. Yeah. Stefanos, Spiros, Sifandos. That's dope. <laughs> I mean, you're bringing, you got a strong name game. Yeah. Real fucking yeah. strong. I usually cheat and just call you Steph because I'm like, I know I'm going to fuck up That's Stephanos. what everyone should call me. Is yeah. that's, everyone calls me. I've been called Steph all my life or my dad would call me Stefana, which is, or when I was really little, Naki, because Stefanaki is what you'd call um, like a little boy. And so Naki for sure. And so my family would call me Naki or Stefana or that's it. And then my friends in Australia, because I grew up there largely, Steph, just Steph. And I'm wondering, because uh, Stephanie, Steph is uh, definitely in, in America is a, was a woman's name, girl's yeah. name. Did you have that in Australia? No. I mean, we, ha we have Stephanie in Australia. It's a very popular name. And even in Greek, Stefania, or, you know, in, in, in orthodoxy, Stefania. Is, so the, the name is after my grandfather, just some little some history, and Stephanos is... Um, the first martyr in Christian or Orthodoxy, and he was stoned to death. And so it's Ayo Stephanos, which is Saint Saint Stephanos, which was the first. I'm pretty sure it was. Oh man, actually, I'm pretty sure it's Orthodoxy, basically preaching the word of God, Jesus Christ, and so forth. And because of that, he was stoned to death. That's the origin of that name. So you did not, so stoned to death. So is that why you, you just, you have this, you just, you've taken the stone, the, the Atlas stone into your being and you're like, I'm going to lift these fuckers. I don't care how heavy they are. Uh, sometimes I think. I that, love yeah. when you move the 150 pounder. It's like, mm, let's go. We need, I, we need a heavier one. It, we need you think 200. so? I, th I think we could. 
Oh, fuck. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, the 150, you know, and I'm getting a little bit stronger right now, but the 150 can make me a little bit lightheaded after a rep. Definitely definitely makes me work as well. But I don't think they do um, dead balls in, in 150. I think we'd have to get a, one of those sandbags, like a, like a square, you know, the squarish yes. sandbags. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll have to look. We always need some new toys in there. <laughs> it's always good. Which actually, this, it's, a, it's a great segue. One of the things I want to talk about today. Um, and you know what? I want to apologize for us that 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 intro right there. I'm fucking curious about the name. It's my show, okay? We are gonna get to the good stuff though. I promise you. So fucking hang tight, <laughs> granny panties in a bunch over this. Um, brother, we 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 really connected. I'd say a year ago is when we officially met. We yeah. were over at our our friend Aubrey's and yeah. Anahata as we were leaving because we we didn't we were kind of at two ends of the two different ends of the table. And she's like. You two brothers need to meet. Yeah. I'm like, I saw you and I knew a little bit about you on Instagram. I'm like, absolutely. Like this guy, I love his energy. I don't know much about him. And it just, COVID hit. Everyone went on lockdown. And then we finally connected in November. Mm. And then it was just like, yeah, we just fucking Bang. knew. It's so beautiful. Yeah. 100% man. And you know, you, I was speaking about this the other day with, I can't remember who I was talking to, but... <clears throat> How personally blessed I've been in my life to have, I think I was speaking with Colin actually, just fucking amazing men in my life. Like having a brother wound or like a male friend wound is, has not been one of my things. Don't get me wrong, I've had issues with friends before, you know, like tension, pain, challenges, arguments, whatever, but it's it hasn't been an issue for me. I haven't been isolated in my brotherhood. You know, and I feel very, very blessed for that. And so when I meet someone and when we meet each other and there's just that that coming together, that connection, it's just you, you sort of know you know. And for me, I very much nurture and relish those relationships because I know being in men's work but also just being a keen observer of human nature, I see how isolated men are and how much pain they are in because they're so fucking alone. So alone. And I, we're definitely going to drop into that in a little bit. Um, but, but one of the things I wanted to, to, to share with everyone who may or may not know about this, if you follow either of us on Instagram, you're probably very familiar with this, but in November when we met, I believe the guys, you'd had a small group of guys working out at your place. Yes. Is that right? Right. Yeah. In your garage. And, um, one of the guys, I think it was Preston was like, yeah. Hey Cal, you got, you know, you got the bunker. Like, yeah. can we, can we do the Wednesday workout at your yeah. place? I'm like, yeah, that's great. And I hadn't been working out. Yeah. You know, I was like, okay, it'd be fun. Like, the, I love these guys. They're fun. I'd love to get to know them better. What better way than to sweat a little bit, listen to some music, you know, some high fives, a little, you know, slaps on the ass. And it's the only way. Dude, we're, we're going on, I mean, I'm like struggling with the math here, but five months. Yeah, every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. And it's grown. The group has grown. I think the, the max was, we had 28 a couple times. And it's so many people. Fucking magic. It is, man. The energy is, it, it's. You, I mean, I'm sure you get this, but I, when I put that up in my stories, I share that. I have so many men reaching out going, wow, like I want that. That looks amazing. Where are you guys? Like, what's going on? Just so much inquiry, so much. And you can, you can. I mean, I'm projecting. I'm, I am projecting into it, but I feel, feel, feel free. Yeah, well, that's right. This is a projection <laughs> yeah, accepting Welcome zone. Welcome to projections. <laughs> I feel that these men are just dying for it. Mm -hmm. fucking dying for it which is why i bring it up right it's not to say hey look how great we have it it's no, no. fucking if you're feeling that create it in your community start with a couple guys and, and it can be women too like but for us it's a brotherhood and i say one of the the best things i heard recently a friend of mine who who came in late kind of he's been here for probably six weeks as part of the group and um highly accomplished athlete mm. and kind of in that second and almost third stage of his life. And I would say after the third week of showing up, he stayed, stayed around after and he, you know, I don't think he'd mind. I won't say his name, but he, he got emotional. He's like, I, I, I didn't realize how much I needed this. He goes, I don't even know what anybody does. And I'm like, yes, it's the magic. Now, People will know if you're on Instagram, you will know what some people do, some transformational coaches, whatever. But by and large, people show up. That conversation is never had. And it's just 
men being there working out in teams, sweating, go as hard as you want, go as easy as you want. It's fucking totally judgment free zone with the exception of sometimes you meet you and Colin get <laughs> getting a little dick measuring contest, <laughs> which you got to have that too, right? It's all, it's all in good fun. Mm. We listen to some music that, you know, my teenage daughter would listen to because it, you know, for me today, that's what occurred to me when we worked out today. I'm like, yeah. it just activates the inner child. And so sometimes it's, you know, you have the heavy metal or the, you know, the hip hop and that's gangster rap. Yeah. And that's fun too. But it's like that other music, it's like, it's, it's like, it's permissible. And yeah. it's fun. And we dance around and it's 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 been such a blessing to have the brotherhood come here and to see the connections that are being made within it. I think it's bringing men back to their roots, man. It's bringing men back to strength and mastery. There's a there's an author, Jack Donovan, and um he he can, he's a he's an awesome from my perspective he's an awesome writer and he speaks to men's men's issues men's work men's stuff you know the evolution of masculinity and males and so forth and he he has something called the four tactical virtues and two of them are, are mastery and strength and I've added one into that and that is and you know, so I've got five although you know definitely piggybacking off of um, Donovan's work but and that is connectivity. You know the connection oh. that we share as as it's we we've evolved this way we've evolved with side by side brotherhood, you know exploring terrains that are unknown, extending the perimeter of what's been safe, being out in the wild, and when we're working hard and we're our body's under physical stress and we couple that with an objective, something happens in our physiology and our psychology that 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 brings us into this state of okay, I'm, I'm in the sympathetic arousal here. I am, I am, I'm, I'm almost in a fight or flight situation. I'm going to fight my way through it. And then you, when you share that experience with a group of men and you've done it together, this is why the military is so effective, right? Uh. And you've done it together. There's a bond that's created over that hardship. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you an interesting story. And I heard this uh, a couple of years ago. I actually heard it from Christine, my wife. And so, you know that saying, blood is thicker than water? Yeah. Do you know the origin of that? No. So, he, and I don't know if this is true, so, you know, any fact checkers out there, just <laughs> yeah. fuck it. We're not talking about the fake fact checkers <laughs> yeah. that work for fucking Google yeah. either and yeah. Facebook. Yeah, and, and p political correctness is another <laughs> conversation. Maybe we'll have it, maybe we won't, but don't fucking get me started on that. Anyway, fact check it, right? But irrespective, take what you want from this. So, it's traditionally, blood is thicker than water is, is um, interpreted as the family bond is thicker than strangers, right? It's more important, it's more integral, it's, it's a deeper bond than strangers. But what it really means, according to this um, ethos, is that the blood shed on the battlefield is thicker than the water in the womb. And when I hear that, I'm like, fuck, there's some deep truth to that. I have done things and I have experienced, even, even some of the intimate moments that we have shared, that is... That is deep, man. Now, again, I'm very blessed that, um, and over, I've worked on it for many, many years, but I have an amazing relationship with my family, mm. my blood family, mm. right? Um, and it's, it's very deep. And I can imagine if I did not, and there were times in my life where I did not, and I've, like I said, I've had to do a lot of work around that, we all have, um, that you sometimes as an individual, we as individuals rely on those intimate bonds. And when we, sh when we experience deep challenge and pain with each other, and we, we live through that, man, there's something special that happens it, it's that, that, that unites us. And so, you know, the, the workouts, the training, it, it really it does resemble, you know, a shade of that deep visceral challenge that you would experience and having to go through that war together. Yeah. It, okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't want to trigger anybody who says that friends are closer than family because you've gone through these experiences. So just... You know, be be open to, to this conversation, but this is what CrossFit got right. They got yes. this so right. Yeah. This is what I love about it. it because you would you're going to quote unquote battle every fucking day with these men and women, and at the end of it, you've you've suffered together. And you've overcome together. Yes, it's yeah. so good, and you've lived through it together. And I think there's there's something to be said for that. I think there's something to be said for taking ourselves through particularly men through challenge i think that's one of the languages of the masculine is that is 
Um, we speak the language of challenge. We thrive in challenge and overcoming challenge and the discipline that's involved in that and the confidence that's derived from that and the self-worth and the self-reflection that comes from that as well. Um, you know, I, I think it would be very hard-pressed for, in, 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 a, in a heterosexual normative relationship, heteronormative relationship, that a woman wouldn't find a man that is genuinely confident, attractive. And one of the ways that we can be confident, not arrogant, confident is through overcoming regular challenge and knowing ourselves i mean the greats have spoken about this whether it's sophocles or socrates or plato or seneca or uh, aurelius so, you know self-knowledge self-awareness knowing yourself and what not be there are better ways that there but one of the greatest ways to know ourselves is to take ourselves to the edge and find out who are we really yes and i think where a lot of us get it wrong is when we look at everything as having an edge and everything's a challenge. And, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And it's, there's, there's not the nuance around that. And I think a lot of us spend, you know, spend our lives or a good part of our lives doing that. And it's not that it's good or bad. It's just like in doing that, right, in overcoming every friggin' thing, you create resiliency, you create mastery. But then it's like if you can just zoom out a little bit and then every your life doesn't have to be fucking hard. You don't have to earn, quote unquote earn everything you get. Some things are just your gift and it's really easy for you to do. I think about you and the work you do, working with men, women, couples, kids. Like it probably comes really easy to you right now. It's not that, you know, you just roll out of bed and you don't have to prepare, but there's something mm. that is, it's, it's a gift that you have likely because of all the work you've done and all the training you've done to be able to hold space, but it's the real life experiences of being in groups, of being in relationships with people. And then it just, it's like you just show up as you and it's not a challenge. And I think a lot of times, again, it, 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 it it's such a masculine thing where it's just always something. It's like there's never any sense of, for some, sense of peace at where they're at. And there's always something. There's that itch. Like what's the next fucking challenge? It's like, bro, how about just chilling out? I heard something once that, um, <clears throat> listening to some Vedanta, that the root of all action is passivity. You know, we often hear the term, the calm before the storm, but it's cyclical. The calm doesn't exist without the storm, and so there's also a storm before the calm. Mm. And so that root of all action comes from passivity. I also think of some of the, you know, the greatest entrepreneurial minds in the world and some of the greatest minds in the world, like Albert Einstein, as an example, but, but many, they will often have their greatest moments of of um, a flatus, like their, their in divine inspiration, whatever it is, their realizations, their mathematical equation, in between that space of not thinking about the problem or the issue or the challenge, but just being in their own space, being in in their in their lives, you know, whether it's holidaying or walking on the beach or engaging in something that's fun and play and they're being curious there's a there's a relaxation that happens in the nervous system in the in the psychology and boom the space is created for that new idea to be born right and so whilst challenge is so deeply important i think for all of us as human beings because mm. it's one of the reasons why we're here today reprieve and rest and space is equally as important yeah i love thank you for sharing that and i would love i would love to like you're working, you do work with a lot of people. So when you're working with a man who's kind of in that traditional mindset, what are some of the practices that you'll you'll share with them? Like, hey, try this out yeah. to give yourself that space. Yeah, specifically for that. Because um, there, there are men that are such, I mean, I think I'm a high achiever. I get hard on myself. I go, I go into shame cycles if I think I'm not doing enough. I, I, I deem myself to be unworthy. For me, it's bringing them into contact. I'll give you a real life example. That's so, what I'm fucking asking yeah, for. Yeah, I don't want some sort of <laughs> philosophical, no, theoretical talk. You're going to love this. Without naming yeah, names, yeah, obviously. That's it. Without naming names, you're going to love this. So I had a, I had a client that was... Colin. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't him. He doesn't... Hey, eh, does he need to reprieve? Maybe sometimes. <laughs> he's, pretty, he's pretty good at regulating himself. Mm. Um, 
had a client. He was he was from um, oh shit, oh, Tanzania. So he's working in Tanzania, um, traveling to Middle East and traveling to the UK a lot for work. Right, has massive company. Um, when I say massive, it's a few hundred employees, but it's a it's a, a multinational company with respect to his distribution, his services, and his and his product development. Very high achiever. Um, definitely an entrepreneurial mind. Definitely successful, materially successful by by those outward standards, right? Yeah, those perfect. metrics. Yep. Very very difficult, challenging relationship with his father. Very, and his father's still involved in the business. Father's very high profile. A lot of issues. And a lot of pain and trauma that's unprocessed. One of the reasons why he's coming to me. This guy works almost 24-7. Just working, working, working. I said to him, you're in Dubai next, right? He said, I'm in Dubai next week. This is a few months ago. Maybe even longer. I said, I need you to do something for me. I need you to take some time for yourself. Now, before we said that, I identified some things that really made him happy in his childhood. Mm. One of those things were going to theme parks. Mm. So when he was in Dubai, he took one whole day to go to Atlantis and to the water slides and the theme parks there and he just went for it. And he would just send me, you know how they take photos of you when you're going down the slide? Yes. Just that. No. It was the, he said, it was one of the best times I've had ever. <sighs> and so I say that, I bring that up because this guy's a serious guy. He's doing international business, not only with, in the private sector, but intergovernmental as well. So the cross-section of private and government, right? So he's a serious guy, meeting with diplomats, meeting with uh, vice presidents, depending on which country. Like he, he's a serious guy. Mm. I just got him by himself. He wasn't with anyone else. He just went there the whole day by himself and he fucking loved it and he relished it. doesn't matter who you think you are, what your net worth is, you know, how serious you think you are. There's always room for fun. Always. That is so good. That's such great medicine. Oh my gosh! The and best. Was there any tension for him? He's just like, uh, was he trying to like not do it? Because that's a huge shift from like working twenty four seven to going quote unquote fucking off in a theme park. Yeah, we'd been we'd been working together for a few months by that point, so the tension was less. He was very open, but with trepidation. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, I'm going to be able to do it, make time. Uh, like I should be doing this. I should. I'm, just, just try, trust me, do this for me. Actually, don't do it for you, do it for me. Because, you know, when you ask someone to do something for you, most of the time it's a little, it's, it's easier, right, to get their buy-in, yeah. <laughs> depending yeah, yeah. on their personality. So, yeah. And I knew that. So I, I, I um, healthily took advantage of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes you got to pull on all the levers. <laughs> you gotta. Well, this brings us to how you showed up today. This inner child activation, which is so fucking good. I don't even know what to do now when you're saying it. Yes, look at you. You're getting all okay. Look, I want it fucking right here, right now. I need, I need to start opening them up. So tell everyone <laughs> what, what, what gave you goosebumps, legit goosebumps that legit. I could witness. I, I used to collect basketball cards when I was younger and I loved it. It was one of the, it was one of the few things. I had a very tumultuous, turbulent childhood. A lot of pain, a lot of trauma. Um, no less or more than others, just it was was what it was. One of the few refuges that I had were watching TV with my grandparents. Um, God rest their, bless their souls. Um, food, which my grandmother would make for me, mm-hmm. um, and my basketball cards. And I, I mean, I haven't collected for so long. And, you know, when we were talking on it, must have been a few weeks ago, with Garen and yourself, and it just came, I just fucking came alive, man. I just came alive. And speaking with my friend Nikhil, um, which, you, which you met today on the phone because we had to call him about some basketball things, um, I ordered a few boxes yesterday. I just can't wait for them to arrive, unopened box, so I can open them up and just, I mean, yes, if I get a, a, a card that's worth something in monetary value, great, but I don't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in opening these things up and putting them in order and put, I've got, I've got the folder coming you as do. well. Oh, it's coming from Amazon. It should be, be, be here today. Of course. I've got my first box coming today, but then the next are coming like in a couple of weeks. And I just can't wait to open those with us together. Like I'm so excited, man. I, I can't tell you how excited I am to just look at these cards and, and, and examine them and do some more research on them. It's just so nostalgic for me. Just so nostalgic, man. 
Yeah, and for those of you listening, this podcast will be out before we do this this card opening. So I'm going to open cards. Steph's going to open cards. I'm sure Garen's going to open cards. And Nikhil will probably open some cards as well, right? I'd say so. Yeah, 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 for sure. So keep an eye out for that. It's going to be, we'll call it uh, the beginning of May. Mm. So keep your, your IG awake there. <laughs> but um, I, you bring up an interesting point because we were talking about this before. You were asking me like, so what's the, what's the value of these boxes? Like, how do you determine that? And um, one of the things I shared with you is some people buy these boxes and they'll hold them for a couple of years. And, you know, certainly the last number of years, you can sell it for a really healthy profit, you know, maybe two extra return, which it's really hard to find those out there unless yeah. you're in, just in crypto. Which, yeah. <laughs> but if, if you don't want to go there, like, Buying a box of unopened cards, holding them, and then selling them, you're going to make money. Yeah. But you and I have a different angle on That's it. That's right. Because that, that doesn't do that. activate the inner child. You don't get to see what's in the... No. You're buying it like you want to see the cards. And and then there's a the little bit of the gambling thing oh, where yeah. it's like, I want to fucking pull an expensive <laughs> card <laughs> yes. too. It's it's the dopamine rush of that, right? Yes. The anticipatory, the anticipation, uh, anticipation of that. I, I want to sit on the carpet. I want to sit on the ground and I want to put the boxes out. And I want to start carefully opening them up, put the wrappers there and, and start allocating them and sorting them all out and, and looking at them and reading them. I want to go, I want to be able to share that experience with someone and I want to do it by myself as well. Yeah. I don't want to just get a box and go, oh, great, I'll put this on the shelf. Like, that, I'm not, that's not a bad thing because obviously I'm asking you questions because I'm, I, I'd like to consider myself an astute investor within the parameters of my knowledge, right? So if I'm going to do this, I was like, hey, hey, it would be great to make some money as well, at least have some uh, tangible um, monetary value in it, of course. But that's not where, that is not the primary purpose of this. It is about connecting to that part of me that felt safe when I was young that had fun, that would remember going to Al's card shop with my mother on a Saturday morning. She'd I'd beg her to take me there and I could get some packs and some boxes and very rarely boxes, but packs, right? That was a treat. And then she'd take me for an ice cream or something. So, you know, that that is, for me, that is what I'm connecting to. It's that. And to do that and to share that with, you know, brothers and men that also remember that in their own way, and just the excitement and the aliveness of that. I do a lot of serious shit, man. I mean, I work with people with severe trauma. Mm. Um, you know, it's I'm serious enough in my life. I'm creating in the world. I'm involved in different businesses. Um, I just want to have fun. I want to play a lot. You know, like the other day I went paintballing for the first time. I can't believe I've never been paintballing. I can't before. believe you <laughs> hadn't been either. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah. Just lighting everyone up. It was it was so much fun. It just I need personally, I need that in my life. Um, and I know I do because I condense my days a great deal. Um, I mean, it's taken us a fair amount just to, it was over a month now to arrange this one when we started talking about That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, at least a month, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I know, you know, you, you have things on as well, of course, but you have come, and if you don't mind, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, you don't know what I'm going to share, share but I think you've, you've just come to a place in your life where you're able to have more space. You know, we're at different life stages, but similar at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um in so many regards, but you, and you have that. And I'm like, yes, I want that. And I still don't want that just yet. I'm still in a very big building phase of my life. And so I still want to keep building, but I also, I, I know the importance and the value of play. I just, I don't, I don't just know it. I know the suffering of not having it. Yeah. And so you and I, for the past five months, I've spent a lot of time with you. I've seen you in a, in a lot of different situations. What and, a blessing for me too. Oh, likewise, my brother. Oof. Um, I've seen you keyed up excited a lot, but I, I really don't know if I've seen you as as I witnessed you before we got on here. Yeah. And, and for me, like I see that and I'm like, that's something that I started to tap into with the help of our brother Garen. And what it's done for me is I've started to use that lens of joy and play and fun in other areas of my life, certainly yes. going into more in the investing pieces. Cause this, you know, really cards are an investment, but it's like, if, if we can start to just loosen up the, 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 the grip on life and realize that we don't have to take shit so fucking seriously. And it starts with that fucking experience that you had lit up getting these cards coming. They haven't even come They're coming. Just it, it's life in my brief experience in this 
kind of headspace can be like that. It yeah. doesn't mean it's always going to be like it, but that for me is like, that's what I'm orienting towards. That's what I'm calling into my life right now. Mm. And it's not that Peyton and I don't have our challenges and I don't have stuff with the kids where I still got to be a parent and figure that out and not be cool dad, but be cool dad that's teaching lessons, which came up today. I'll give you one. Dude, I get a text. So it's, it's for, for context, it's Monday morning. I get this text from my um, 15 year old. It's 5 in the morning. He's like, uh, Hey dad, I'm, I'm just going to bed. He goes, I got all my schoolwork done. And the way his schoolwork is set up is you can, it's all um, this particular part of it is, is all online. And so they track your minutes. He's like, I got a lot of schoolwork going into the week. He's basically ahead for the week. And I got paid $60 to edit some videos. He goes, would it be okay if I did school from home today, which is code for like fucking sleep all day, and um, and then go get them tomorrow? And uh, I sat with it for a second. I said, you know, I get it. I get it. You overextended. Like, um, you know, and I, I haven't been the heavy. You know, I haven't been that oppressive dad. I have in the past. I know that. I know that role really well. I'm like, okay. You know, cool dad was like, the response was going to be, yeah, no problem. Just, let's not let it happen again. Meanwhile, the, 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 the thing I didn't share with you is that he's hacked the fucking Wi-Fi where I used to turn it off at <laughs> night. He fucking went and hacked it with some code. And I'm like, okay, so that, that game's out. I mean, I can take his desktop away that also came to my mind. That felt a little bit oppressive. So I meditated. And uh, I came out of the meditation. I said, you know, um, I think this is a good lesson in this. That you, you're going to go to school today. Um, you learn how to, I know you gamed a lot this weekend. And I know at the end of the weekend, you did all these things that are really cool. Not that gaming is not cool, but you spent an excessive <laughs> amount of time gaming. And um, I think there's a lesson in here for you. And for me, in my kind of backroom talk, I'm like, I can still be cool dad and understanding dad and let him not rob him of the lesson. Mm -hmm. You got to manage your time. You made choices that put you in this state that you don't feel like you could make it through school today, which I totally understand. And so he received it and he came down. He started making himself some rice to eat and he made one last one one last pitch. <laughs> it was like at seven o'clock, and he's like, came in, looked like fucking death, and he came in my office. He's like, uh, "Hey Sal, like, what do you think?" He calls me Sal. He says, "Sal, what do you think?" I go, "Buddy, I love you, but this is like, this is just an important thing for you to understand and for you to feel it. So when you're when you're faced with this decision, the next time." You, you will have felt all of this. He's like, I'm not going to be able to think critically today. I'm like, yeah, of course not. Fuck, I don't want you to think critically. But part of your responsibility, part of your commitment is showing up at school. And sometimes it's just showing up as a warm body. And, um, and I was very clear. I said, I'm not fucking disappointed in you. I'm not bummed out about any of this. Like, fucking, I get it. But we're going to do this thing. So... So I texted him. He downed fucking <laughs> down two uh, iced coffees on the way to school. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You've got to space those out. What the fuck? He's learning. That's what he's doing. Yes, that's right. <laughs> he's growing. And he's just like choking. Just like, ah, it tastes like shit. And I'm like, okay. But I texted him at like, I think it was like 11, 11 30. I'm like, how you doing? He's like, I'm good. So he's almost there. He's got until 3 30 to fucking survive. <laughs> I think I'm not a father yet, brother, but I've been a son and I am a son still. Um, from my perspective, that approach is so empowering and so honest and not oppressive. Because I think, you know, when we oppress, we limit. It's, it, the, you know, if you were to come down on him and hail on him, all he's going to experience is the level of unsafety he feels in his body. And he's not going to even receive your message or the wisdom or any of that. 
I mean, I don't wish to change anything in my life because I'm very grateful and deeply content with where I am right now. Um, and if I were to speak, you know, openly, I'd say, hey, I wish my father would approach certain things, had of approached certain things like that. Again, wouldn't change a thing. And I really mean that. A number of years ago, I wouldn't have said that. You know, I would have been more ignorant to that. Mm -hmm. um, but that level of care and compassion, yet strength and insight that you provide your son who is in, in, you know, in the middle of puberty and, and going through all these massive changes physiologically and psychosocially um, to be met with that level of attentiveness from uh, you know, the primary masculine figure in his life so powerful man mm. so so bonding and endearing you know it's th it's those moments from my perspective that you know at that compound over periods of time that form those very deep bonds as well because that's a challenge like you were both in challenge and he wanted something you wanted to hear him but you also knew that there's another path and meeting in the middle in that way and not letting it blow out you know, and not letting it go to, to violence, whether it's emotional violence or physical violence or whatever, which, which can so quickly happen when there's conflict, right? Yeah. Um, you know, particularly the abrasiveness and the aggressiveness and to just really sit with that and not judge him. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the, you know, we were speaking about this when we went, went for a walk earlier, that judgment piece. Um, you know, you would use food as an example, but that, that I remember my dad, you know, I mentioned food to you earlier about how it was a refuge for me, but he would also tease me a lot. Like, oh, you, you stop eating, stop eating, you're eating so much, look at you like he'd tease what I'd look like, you know, because he was angry all the time, so he'd project that anger onto me mm. or onto everyone, really, not just me. Um, and I'm, I was very clear of that then, I'm, you know, he's still clear of that now. But the judgment, nothing was ever enough. You, you, you know, you could do... Anything and everything, but it just wasn't quite there. Judgment, you know, judgment is such an inhibitor of love and connection and intimacy and growth. And so when you meet, when I hear that story and I feel that story because I know you at the level that I know you at, and I and I and I envision how you were and how you are with your son, that is a, a deep, deep, rich lesson and signpost for so many fathers out there and so many men and I and I commend you for that and I say that as a compliment as a mm. friend to you but also as someone that's in this space of helping people you know live their best lives and also helping them deal with pain and trauma and fear and all of that what you're doing for that young man because he's a young man now mm. is life-changing the trajectory that you are helping him tread you know walk beyond is just so much value to himself but to every single other person he comes into contact with mm. like think about the domino effect of that if you just said yeah okay you know stay here whatever it was right he he develops that sense of either fixed or rigid mindset he develops that sense of ah oh, well i there's no Repercussions is a strong word. There's consequence. No ex consequence, experiential outcome for my mm. actions. Like there's a disconnection there between how he acts and what happens in the world. Then, then a selfishness and a self-absorption takes over more and more. Like that's not socially healthy either, right? There's yeah. just there's just so much that I can unpack from that moment this morning. Thank you. I receive that that very much and. Uh, and it's not that these things weren't going through my mind. Like on the mm. one hand, it's fucking one day of school. Who cares? Sure. Okay. Um, wanted to be the cool dad and be understanding. Also, at one point, thought, do I need to take his computer away? So it's like I had all all of them were, were playing around in my head, and I think almost like back to what we were talking about before. We can just get quiet. Mm. Like what feels right? What feels like it's going to serve me? And as a father, and in, in, in really showing up how I want to show up and what's going to give him the lesson that he'll really, you know, have has a great chance of receiving versus what you said, like being up there and just drop, you know, dropping the hammer on him and like fucking taking this out. Well, you fucking, how can you stay up till five in the morning? What the, f like all that shit, because I've done that before too. And it, it just, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. No. And you know, something that, 
I think is worth mentioning is the fact that he messaged you. He feels safe enough to message you at 5 a.m. in the morning to say and tell you the truth. Hey, Dad, this is what happened. Stayed up all night. Yep, I do have my homework. You know, I've, I've, I've done all. I've done everything. I've done. I've met my responsibilities, and this is what has truthfully happened. I know I'm not meant to be doing that, but this is what's truthfully happened. And then making that request to feel safe enough to tell you, and then to make the request of what he wants. That's on you. That is a reflection of who you are, of the family that you and Peyton hold here, the dynamic of the household, of the energy in the home. For him to feel safe enough to actually go there. I would have never felt, I had to, I remember as a kid, <laughs> I'd always have to ask my mum, I'd have to convince my mum to try and convince my dad of something that I wanted to do. Like even just going to a friend's house because I was so scared of him just A, saying no and B, just reprimanding me for just asking the question. Dude, I, I had a lot of safety in my mom too. It was just like, if we could have, could we make the decision without bringing dad in? And that was like kind of the best case scenario, yeah. right? Because yeah. dad wasn't always um, logical with this like, dude, who fucking, can? like, but it's like that sense of control. Yeah. Like I need to fucking control what everybody's doing. Mm. And uh, yeah, oof. Anyway, um, let's talk about relationships and um you and christine actually you you guys do a lot of work in that space but you also speak a lot on different podcasts as a couple which i think is so dope and what is what is like the one you know what is the one thing that you see today is there one thing is there something that stands out that's like the barrier between couples. Like what is it that they can't get through that it's their blind spot and until they actually work in that space, there will be no resolution. There's just going to be all that tension, the triggering back and forth. Is there anything that comes to mind when, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it definitely There's a few things. Um, one that I notice the most, that we notice the most, and also in our relationship it's a very real thing, is communicating and expressing our truths. And we fear expressing our truth because we fear the potential worst-case scenario of that truth or the repercussion or the consequence of what that truth may bring, whether it be conflict, whether it be separation, whether it be uh, an argument, whether it be distance, whether it be them taking something from us, whether it be less sex, like well, you name it, or whatever your fear is, it doesn't have to be the biggest fear, but whatever your fear is, and so we withhold, right? Even if you're a quote-unquote confrontational person, or you don't mind being in conflict, like I have generally no issues being confrontational or being in conflict, because I grew up in that. It was difficult as a kid, but then as a teenager and as a young adult, like I thrived in that, and I often... It's a maladaptive coping strategy for me now. Like I, I jump into conflict or I jump into <laughs> confrontation. Yeah. And you know, I've told you, said a couple yes. of stories with you, right? like, and, and I've got to pull myself out because that's not the healthy, it's not the healthy way to, to be really. Because it's, it's arcing me up. Like my, my nervous system isn't, isn't stable and grounded and, and regulated. And I'm going to this worst case scenario because it's coming from an old protective place. Like I've got to, I've got to attack before someone else attacks, you know. So I grew up in that violence, right. Um, and so it, it, one of those things is, you know, couples withhold their truth, you know, and, and I said, and I, I mentioned Christine and I are no different. I don't have to look to the many, many clients that I have. I'll just use our example. Like on Saturday, um, we, we had, um, one of our very dear and close friends, um, take us through a coach. She's also a coach, one of the best coaches I know. Um, she's phenomenal. And um, there's very few people that I trust. Um, and because I hold myself to a high level and a high caliber, and I see what an amazing coach Christine is as well, th there's very, it's not there's very few people that I trust. I'm a very trusting person, but there's very few people that I can, um, I know can hold my energy and hold what is, is there. And so she took us through a session because Christine called for it. She said, look, there's some things that I really want to share with you, but I don't feel well, I'm going to say this, it fucking hurts me to say it, but it's the truth. Um, you scare me, Steph, and they're, they're, that's very hard for a man to hear from someone that he loves de dearly and deeply and cares for his wife. And I just want to have the platform 
and the opportunity to share these things with someone that I know can hold your energy, that knows us both really well, she's a dear friend, um, that knows me so well, that is, is a safe space, but also is strong enough to hold our energies. And I said, of course, like I, I of course, as much as that aggravates me and hurts me to hear that, um, and, and let me caveat that by saying, you know, Christine would say, I know you're never going to hurt me. I'm just very, I'm scared of you sometimes because your energy is so big or you're reactive or, you know, you're, you're, you're not in, in, in as much control as your temp, with your temper as you could be. And there's some volatility there. And, and because of that, there's some inconsistency. And, and all of that is true. I've got to own that. Like, you know, we practice, we, we teach what we need to learn the most. So I mm. teach all these things and so mm. I get to practice them as well. Right? I can listen to that one, by the way, everyone. That is the truth. That is the truth, man. And so there, there is shame. Um, there's a very low level of shame now coming up when I'm talking to you about this um, because it's it's a very hard thing to hear to say, you know, you scare me. Like that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing to hear, right? And so, but we had that, that session on Saturday and it was a couple of hours and Christine was really able to express some things that were very important to her that she wasn't able to express without that. And what followed the following day was um, her seeing me hold that in a healthy way. And the following day was her and I together where she went really deep into some more expression, some more things that were just unsaid. Because, And again, I'm very clear and she's very clear. That's her patterns. That's her, but I'm not facilitating it in a healthy way like so i've got to change i've got it well i don't have to but i want to i choose to mm. and she gets to shift and, and stepping into her and so we went for a walk on sunday morning there was a lot of emotions a lot of things that are coming out and and she said yeah i said is there anything else you want to say i know there's a few things but one thing right now she says yeah there is and it took her like five minutes to say it she just couldn't but then she did and we went through a whole process and i held some space for her and more than some space so we we really got her to move it somatically and and it was a tremendous honour to then see her um, feel safe enough to express that and for me not to let my shit get in the way, you know, because we talk about holding space, but these are just terms. We, there's, in the spiritual community, there's so many terms we throw around, like hold space. Like, what the fuck does that even mean <laughs> yeah. most people? Don't, ultimately, it's, you know, it's our ability to not be reactive and be responsive. It's not to bring our shit to the table when someone else is saying, hey, man, I'm in a lot of pain right now or you've done this and... We can set healthy boundaries and be self-honoring, but we don't have to get triggered and charged when someone's bringing stuff to us. And the only way we can do that is when we do our own inner work. And so these situations, they cause us to, to step into that power, right? To step into that sovereignty and say, okay, I, my partner is sharing something really painful for her and really difficult. I can be nasty or I can make it all about me or I can get reactive mm. and I can get, you know, well, what about this? And you're not listening to me and I get all defensive or I can just really hear her and listen and hold that, like really hold that without intervening with my emotional charge and not to suppress it, but to actually just be in, this is about her right now. In this moment, it's about her. And so we went through all that process and, you know, coming back to what your original question was, what, what is one of the biggest things that couples go through that, that causes the conflict or the tension is the, it's the unspoken thing. Mm. It's the unspoken thing that compounds over years and years and years or even weeks and months is enough. I get the years thing <laughs> fucking on lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you for sharing that, by the way. And uh, I, I, I didn't clear this with Peyton prior to, but... It's just part of part of being married to me, I guess. I felt um, in some ways maybe not being able to express what I wanted to express in a way that wouldn't uh, trigger something in, in her. So she wouldn't, I didn't feel like she'd be able to hear it. And so I reached out to, um, you know, ask one of our, our brothers, like, I need a, a contact in the, the nonviolent communication space. Got a great woman. Boom. She's great. So we've had a couple calls with her. And I said to her, you know, very, very plainly, like, I, I feel like things get lost in the translation for what I want to share. And maybe I'm not being super clear either. And, and, and it's, so it's not just for Peyton to receive, but it's for me to articulate better and for me to get pushed into what do you really mean with that and uh again we're, we're, we're two calls in and it's been amazing one of the one of the things that i was really struggling with was whew, i 
you know, I spent a, a, a decent part of our marriage kind of checked out and uh, certainly not showing up like I did this morning for Bowen. But um, I felt like I'd moved past it. I said, this is the fucking kind of the new me. Like I've done the work. Like I'm here. I'm, pr I'm, I'm actually present, not just in physical, but I'm here energetically too. And I'm like, I feel like Peyton can use the past against me still. And I'm like, I just want to be here now with us. Like, let's move forward. And, um, you know, as we, as we work through that, uh, it became very clear to me that I was carrying my past, that I had shame around it. Mm. And that I had as much to do, if not more, than she did. And maybe I was just seeing it because I was looking for it, because I was carrying that shame. And so it was this is just beautiful process of us sitting, me sitting with that shame and really working through it and getting back. You know, we did some inner child work. And, whew, one of the most amazing things happened. The invitation was to sit with that younger version of me, that four or five year old version of me, and um, reparent him. Mm. I was like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. So the next day I'm in my meditation, and I, I call in that younger version of me, and I was, I was upset about something. I was crying. And uh, I wasn't the one that showed up. It was Peyton. And in that moment, I knew why I chose her. That she was the one I've been looking for all along. And I just wasn't able to receive it. Because I didn't know what to do with it. They had all, you know, entangled in, in all those different stories. And once I had that awareness, I literally went into the bedroom. She was just getting up. And I literally laid on her chest like a little boy mm. and just cried and shared with her that I was so grateful that she'd come into my life, that she was the one I've been looking for and, you know, ready to receive her love. And I know that on some level those are just words, but that intention is there now. Yeah, so fucking major process that just if when when the container's right and the intentions are right and you have the right facilitator, it can fucking move like that. And you know, our shit's changed significantly. And you know, and I think part of what you're talking about is like sharing, like being honest about what our needs are. Yeah. You know, and part of my lens on her needs was I felt like she was being needy. That was my own stuff. Like, this is the woman you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Like, why don't you listen rather than not feel like you can meet those needs and it's hard and, and just meet those needs. So anyway, I'm glad you brought that up. These <laughs> fucking years and years. That's a really powerful share, man. And I could really feel that. And it, it really goes to, I mentioned the sharing piece or speaking our truth, but even that that piece of walking into that bedroom and, and laying on her chest and crying, that vulnerability, right? There's also a fear to be real and vulnerable because of the rejection or the abandonment or the humiliation or the shutdown that may occur, you know? And it's interesting, the projection or the interpretation of neediness 
you know, probably coming from a place of unresolved stuff within you, of how mum probably was with you, of how she projected a lot of your her needs onto you as a child and you having to grow up quickly, that enmeshment, right, to some level. And, and maybe that sharing that you both just went into and that you seeing yourself from the old lens, you know, we've spoken about this, hasn't given her an opportunity to see you through new lenses. And sometimes as well, when we are on a rapid path of growth, and you have been, and you've made so many changes and you feel that and you live with that every day, every moment of every day, it's sometimes very difficult for others to equally embrace that because they're scared. They're scared to, A, you're changing, and so even though the previous version of you wasn't ideal for them, or the most desirable version, at least it was known and familiar, Ooh. and that's safe. Whew. And so as you change, that rapid change, particularly rapid change, it's like, well, can I trust this person? Can I trust it to be sustainable and consistent? And do I want this? Like Sometimes it's better the devil we know. Uh. That, and, 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 and she's still bringing her fears in into the relationship, and this is the dance, right? This is the dance, and you going in there, and into the bedroom and giving in that way and Peyton allowing that to like really receive that and not reject it. I mean, that's both of you dancing. You mentioned something about you haven't been able to receive her. Our ability to receive is directly, directly, intimately connected with our self-worth. And whilst we may project that we have all the things or we do all the things and the status and the titles and the happy face and all of that. Fundamentally, if we are struggling to receive, particularly intimacy and love and care, affection, closeness, it is a reflection of low self-worth, mm. a belief that we hold, a false belief that we are not worthy to receive that love or that it may come to us but we may lose it or we may taint it, and we don't trust ourselves to be able to hold it. And that's the deep work, and the mirror and the reflection that is your partner and is your partnership, that is the opportunity to explore that at a deeper level. That's the fucking power. That's what so many of us in relationship miss, because we're too busy blaming the other person mm -hmm. and projecting, it's their stuff, it's their stuff. But hold on a second, we're the common denominators in our lives. Now, I'm not saying be a punching bag, definitely not. But I am saying is can we look at ourselves? This is a reminder for me. Teach what we need to learn the most. Like, yeah. can I, when, when Christine's aggravating me or there's a pattern there, what's my role in that? Like, can that be the first port of call, not what she's doing and externalise it? Because the ego then feels satisfied with, oh, it's not my fault, so we can diffuse the responsibility. We've got to go beyond that. And that's something I'm deeply learning more and more into being that humility. And when someone is saying these things about you of how you're behaving that are embarrassing and are shameful, you know, and, and another example of that is it wasn't that long ago, it was a few weeks ago where we were looking after our sister's, uh, her sister's dog and he was just, he's a puppy man, he's a big puppy, but he was just all over the place and I was trying to, you know, reel him in and so I had to get the laser out and run him out and play him and but I was it was like one AM in the morning and, and, and I was <laughs> I was Shit. getting aggravated and, and, and you know things had happened and I said to Christine, This isn't a good idea. We shouldn't be having this pup but she needed the pup or wanted the pup to look out. It was it was all so I was angry at her and, and, and she got really, really scared of how I was behaving. Right, and and we have to remember that our thresholds, you know, your threshold and Peyton's threshold, or your kids' thresholds, or the range of what is deemed to be safe and unsafe, it differs for everyone, right? And you know, in that moment, like, I ended up, I got, went to bed, and I went to bed quickly, but she stayed up all night in panic, like scared, like her nervous system was shocked, you know. And so, we we have to be able to come back from those experiences, but we have to be safe enough for, and that was one of the things that we we. Christine and I went on on Sunday. Like she, she this was like a month ago, and and, and she wanted to speak about that because she ha she had held it in. Because the next morning I came to her and I apologized for my actions, and I apologized for, um, I felt shame, and I apologized for who I was, 
um, very similar because I had the realization, and and she was like, oh, well, that's great, he's he's owning it, but she didn't get a chance to express her truth. Mm. So as you went into that bedroom with Peyton, and you had those massive realizations. Often our realizations are so much bigger for us than they are for other people. You've gone in there and you've opened up that dance, right? Mm. And now, as you've opened up that dance, patience and compassion and non-judgment is so important as Peyton now comes back into that dance with you and as she tests the waters as well. Like, is this real? Real meaning, is it sustainable? Is it long-lasting change or is it just something that's just occurred spontaneously but is going to fizzle out now? So come back, keep coming back to that openness and that truth that is you, brother, because, I mean, I'm sure... Hayden needs a number of different things, but that there is going to be very empowering for you both. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, f- I feel that. And just what you said, too, she's expressed, like, she, one of the concerns is, are you going to be so enlightened or, you know, so conscious that you're just going to leave me? You know, because my process is different than her process. Mm. You know, mine's a little bit... Um, I want to say faster, but I, I move at a pretty quick pace. doesn't mean I get it all right, but yeah. she's kind of much more deliberate with her practices. And um, I think there's, there's an element there. But also, like, is this real? You know, I've seen some version of this before. And so the, you know, there's some hesitancy to, to just fall into the, the belief. And so you're right, the patience and the compassion um, you know, and I feel like I've, we've, we've, we've had enough in the last three years of, of some version of this, not necessarily to this mm. degree where it's, it's taught me patience. Like let, just let her process this just because I said it doesn't mean it's, it's all of a sudden all good. We get so scared, man. I mean, maybe, you know, I'll speak more for myself, but so in the past, particularly, so scared of not being able to control the outcome. You know, what, what, if I behave this way, if I say this, if I do this, I, what, what's going to happen? I, I, I need to make sure it goes the way I want it to go. I think it needs to go. And I've just got to let go of that shit. Yes, and I, I've, I'll, I'll say that's something that, that I've really also stepped into. We were on, I told you we were on spring break uh, in March. Mm inarguably the worst fucking tension-filled trip we've taken as just a family wow. as a collective and um i remember specifically i was sitting outside it was you know in the sun and there was some tension with with me and peyton there was some tension with me and my oldest son and then I didn't really have tension with my daughter except that she was on her phone a lot, and, her, and then th- there was just some messiness going on. And uh, I just remember sitting there and just creating enough space for it to all be. Like, you know, I don't need to f- fix anything right now. I just need to let this be and let it play out how it needs to play out. And so I think even with regards to, you know, the work that Peyton and I are doing right now, just, just like letting whatever needs to emerge, emerge and just follow that. And, and I just, I think it, one of the greatest things I've learned is, you know, particularly in the last couple of years is that we can't control the outcome. And when we strategize and try to land on a particular outcome that we think is going to be the best outcome because that's the other thing we think we know we don't fucking know anything (laughs) we're so bad at predicting but we also we we get out of presence we're just thinking ahead what's the next move and then the next move after that and it's like i just stop all that shit it's even with regards to like my business and what i'm creating i'm like I, i don't plan out it's like what what feels relevant? What feels right? What feels alive for me right now? Maybe it's not posting on social media for three weeks. Like, I don't fucking care. Like, I'm not called to it. Okay, I'm not going to do it. And and I understand I have flexibility around that because sure. I don't have a brand that requires that. 
necessarily or isn't this enhanced by it that much but um it just made life way fucking easier it's just like what feels good and the outcome will be the outcome but when you stay in that state of presence you're never at an outcome you're always in the presence and the outcomes are just they come and go without you even knowing it and you're just playing the game and so my intention is to take that into this, you know, whether it's, you know, stuff that Peyton and I are working on or me and the kids or me and relationships in general. Nothing, nothing has to be solved, figured out. And um, that's, a, a, you know, to plug the podcast, but that's a bit of unlearning for me. And I think a lot of men, like, we're such fixers. We want to fucking get so it right. So much so. So much so, man. In having that patience and in creating enough space in your life for for all the possible outcomes and for all the quote unquote shit that's happening there's learning in all of that yeah what resonated there was a number of things but the presence piece right and i and i wrote to this um not that long ago must have been in the last week presence is one of those words that's very much associated with the masculine and men you know like i think if you were to ask anyone what would what would a healthy quote-unquote masculine trait be somewhere there in the top 10 at least presence is going to be one of them i'm fairly certain top five you know it's, yeah. it's just one of those um qualities that are deeply endearing and connecting right they they help us bond and connect and we're relational beings by by nature and nurture and Therefore, presence, our ability to be in that moment, not have to fix anything or control the outcome, it plays a massive role and it helps the other person feel safe because they feel, there's an attunement there. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's an attunement through our neuroception where our, unconsciously our nervous system is assessing the environment and connecting to what is in alignment with or saying, well, we've got to get out of here, this is unsafe. But something that we often miss with presence is it's easy to say, oh, just be present. Like, you know, stop thinking about <laughs> whatever or trying to control the outcome of the future or whatever it may be. But what really allows us to define the activity of presence, the tangible um, beingness of presence is safety. Come back to safety again. Like, we have to feel safe enough in our own selves as men to be present. Let's peel that back a little more. Okay, mm. so self-gnosis, self-awareness, self-realization, our ability to tra traverse challenges and be confident enough that we, you know, there's, we're, we're capable more of more than what we think we are. Um, learning how to be in difficult situations, how to be emotionally intelligent, how to be able to attune to other people's needs and our own at the same time. Super hard. Super difficult. I call that selfish selflessness. And it's a play on those two words. Mm. And, and, and another term for it is enlightened self-interest. But to be attuned mm. to what we need in the present moment and what the other person needs, there's a lot of deep explorative work that takes place. You know, you, you, you mentioned earlier about space creation. You asked me a question about play and space and, you know, outside the doingness of life. And I gave you that example of my client that went to the theme park and the water, water park in Atlantis there. But you know, something else that's really important and I've found it so critical in my own life is I just like to sit and gaze and stare. I just stare into open space, as, as open, as, as expansive as possible, ideally. I try and do that, I don't try, I do it every day. No so shit. Just a few minutes every day, yeah, but I'm going to sit on my back, in, on my um, uh, upstairs, on my sort of back veranda there and it's just a sort of hill country view and just... Just sit and watch and, and reflect. I'm still thinking, um, not always, but some, most of the time, but I'm reflecting on, okay, what's happened today? Like I'm creating space for reflection. I'm creating space to how can I help myself feel safer? How can I, and I'm not talking about like I'm, I'm scared if I go outside my house that someone's going to rob me. I'm talking about that safety. I'm talking about that, that level of safety of knowing self so well that no matter what, happens in the day no matter how difficult the conversation how confronting it is the emotions that arise you've got you i've got me like how can i help myself be that person be in greater alignment with my my greatest truth and we when we create space we give ourselves an opportunity to explore these ideas and these ideals within self i think i think we miss that in the world we live such a busy world man you know you know better than me 
you you know, I mean, I'm sure your audience knows your past life. You know, when I say past life, you know, where, what your career was. Sure. I mean, that's hectic, hectic. Yeah. Like, where's the space to unwind? Well, there wasn't clearly. <laughs> right, right. And 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 you know, for those who who are new to the podcast, I was an options trader in Chicago. I was on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for 18 years, and it's very interesting because we create space by blowing off steam, by partying, you know, those are the unhealthy ways. No, there are some people who do it right. Yeah. They, and they do, you know, go back and they recharge the batteries. Yeah. Um, and there were periods of time when I did that, but there were periods of time when, when I ran really hot and on adrenaline and on caffeine and not cocaine, as it turns out. But, um, you know, that was probably 10 years prior to us, they were doing that stuff. But very much, um, you can get caught up in the chaos it's yeah. very easy it's a drug and you just feel that like that the drama of it all and the adrenaline definitely is running through you and it's just like one day after the next after the next and and um it's not sustainable and i i kind of recognized that early on i would say it's not that i just stopped partying but i recognized that that my orientation to trading mm. into managing risk into being on the trading floor and all that it wasn't sustainable as I was doing it the first four or five, maybe six years, because I was, it was so intense that I didn't know how to unplug it. It was just like, it was, it was a fucking drug. And uh, I finally just had a, I guess for survival reasons, just had a completely different lens. It started to shift my lens. And I, I left 18, you know, after 18 years, not because I was burnt out. It was just, I was meant to do something else. And, yeah. you know, had the business been humming along and, and been, you know, kind of financially lucrative because it had kind of stopped being in, in my mind, or at least the way I was trading. Um, I could have stayed there a number of years because I really understood by the end, and it's probably not, not by coincidence that in 2009, so I left in 2013, in 2009, I got into CrossFit. And I started to take better care of myself. Now, listen, there were some things that happened downstream when my hormones got shot because I went too hard. Yeah. I was going six days a week, but that was that was on me. But I found the value in taking care of my body, in eating better, in these other practices um, that, uh, yeah, and that's actually kind of why I left because I was, I was kind of done. I wasn't, we weren't, I wasn't really making any money anymore. I just, I didn't, wasn't feeling the, uh, to be frank, I felt like a fraud for probably the last 18 months I was there wow. on some level. I was a partner and I just lost my love for it. Uh, and it wasn't until I read uh, The Way of the Superior Man, uh, yeah, but you know, by David Data, and I read chapter 12 and that has to do with you working on a project that you could leave without any regret that it yeah. seems almost foolish. Like why, like you just can't understand why you're doing it anymore. And uh, I read that and I was literally in a coffee shop on a Sunday. I started crying. I was like, fuck, that's it. Like, and just like all that, like guilt just seemed to wash away it's like that. That wasn't me. That wasn't my fault. I wasn't a bad guy. I wasn't a bad partner. I was just, I just stayed there too long. And, um, you know, kind of at that point realized it was time for me to leave. Was it difficult for you to make that decision and to actually then do it? No, it was actually pretty easy. And part of, part of the way I move through the world, whether it's my human design or astrology <laughs> or any of that, it's like when I have, make a decision, it's fucking, I'm very clear, yeah. especially if, it's, if I'm relying on my instincts and I just knew it was time to leave. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I had, these were my brothers. This was really that, that trading firm. Those were- Right in years, right? Oh yeah. And my two partners- you know, was super close with especially the the main partner. He's a godson to my oldest. We lived on the same street. Whenever, fucking whenever I had anything in my life that was going a little sideways or I needed counsel, he was the guy I went to every fucking time. Like, so I had a deep connection to him. Are you close with him now still? Yes, and when 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 I when we when we were parting ways, when I was leaving, 
I would say um, it got a little uncomfortable uh, and it wasn't personal. And I had great advice. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it from him at the time. But I had another friend, James Fitzgerald, who's like, Cal, this is business. So don't take it personally, but you've also got to take care of yourself. And uh, and so that really helped me because I was starting to take things personally. Like, oh, they're trying to fuck me on this deal and I've got to do this and that. And why won't they just, you know, was, there was a lot of blaming uh, internally about what was going on. And that really just set me straight. Like, look, they get a business that, that they're keeping intact. I'm leaving. They could handle this many ways. Now, it's not the, the, uh, the A-plus version of what fucking Cal wanted, but in, in the interest of fairness, it was, a, it was a really good deal. Yeah. You know, and um, we, it, was, it was a little bit weird after, you know, because I still felt that stuff. It was seven years ago, eight years ago? Yeah, yeah. but we, I mean. Is he older uh, than you? Yes. How much older? Uh, he's probably seven, eight years older. Okay. Very much a father figure to yeah. me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We went on a, someone, a, a mutual friend's 50th birthday vacation to Italy. And, um, you know, we had moved to Austin and I was not in that space anymore. And it was like nothing. It was like nothing had ever happened. He was super curious about all the things. It was mm. beautiful. Mm. And so we have a beautiful relationship. Um you know, got, got really lucky that I landed at a trading firm where there's a man with such a big heart and fucking integrity. Yeah. Like I think in that industry, it's difficult, man. <coughs> so Not hard. Not to be presumptuous, but... <laughs> you know it. it, it, it that's, 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 um, that's what it's like. And I got lucky, you know, to, to have him discover me um, for, that, for that job. So anyway... Thank you for that, 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 uh, to holding space for that. I'm curious. There's something, because, and I mentioned earlier, like I can go on Instagram or not go on Instagram. I got fucking 4,000 followers. It's like, it's not a thing, right? I'm not, I'm not quote unquote selling anything. Um, I have a podcast. I would love to have more impact. Yeah. But you, for, need, you need to have more impact. People need to hear your voice, bro. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, but I have a lot of tension around social media. And, um, so do I. <laughs> yeah, so I was curious, um, what, how, how do you, how do you manage it? How do you, how do you not get sucked into it? Mm. What's the, like, yeah, fucking, cause it's, you're prolific on there, you know, and I'm sure you have people helping you. It's not like you're fucking grinding on Instagram every day and the other ch channels, but what is like, what's your how do you kind of hold all that? Yeah, I can, um, it's been a journey. It's, I think this is a great topic, great topic. Oh, um, good. I didn't even ask you beforehand. Yeah, no, so you, you can talk about anything. Then we don't have to speak to anything that we've already spoken to before. I mean, we can, we can go anywhere is my point. You know that nothing's off limits. Um, well, maybe a couple of things off limits that are out of my understand you know, with, with you know if it's, if I can't speak for myself, but for me, nothing's off limits. So, let me give you the structural thing that I do with um, social media, and then I'll explain my journey with it. And it's an ongoing journey. Let me tell you that. So, when I first started with social media, come with me on a walk into the past. <laughs> When I first started on my journey on social media, I came to Instagram very late. I was on Facebook for a while, but yeah, just more playing around on it. Um, I, well, I was coming off a, off a very big breakup and a very uh, one of the biggest catalysts for my life changing massively. This is about seven years ago. And that's really when everything started moving for me on the trajectory that I'm on now. And I said to myself, you know, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do a video every day, a live video every day on Facebook. Um, I'm going to do a post every day, I'm going to do a video every day. Now, I've been very accustomed to blogging. I mean, if I had smarts back then, I would have uh, monetized my blogging. I was blogging when I was like 22 years old, man, 23 years old, and it was called Sweating Blood. And oh. it was all about my experiences with 
challenge and training and the emotions and the men- the mindset and the mental acuity required to move through you know deep pain and challenge and all those things right mm. i'd write every day sometimes like two thousand word thing shit three thousand words yeah oh, oh man so much so i've been writing for a long time in that way and it's um finally i think it's getting a little better now my writing in terms of the expression I think, you know more relatable and so forth but um and i just did that video every day i'd get one or two views maybe a couple of likes like nothing i'd be despondent i'd be disappointed like oh you know i'd I'd see all these people out there and they're doing all so well and they have thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of followers and like, well, I'm not that bad. Why don't I have, you know, I was doing the comparison and yes. fuck. And that's a, that's the, the devil in disguise, man, the comparison. Mm. Uh, I mean, I still, I still get that now even, mm-hmm. you know, as, you know, I look at other men or I look at other people and what they have and, and, and sometimes if, if I'm in a low state of vibration or energy, it will get me and I'll start spiraling with it, you know. But more often than not, I'm like, it doesn't even doesn't even bother me anymore. But it's still it's still there, you know, it's still one of those beasts, one of those shadows, right? Yeah. And so I just I was just consistent with I just wanted to create content and I wanted to share because I was going through so many deep transformations. Um, and I wanted to share those transformations and, and maybe help other people because I'd been through so multiple dark nights of the soul, like suicidal ideation. It opened up a lot of stuff in me. All my trauma came back to me that I'd suppressed and not dealt with. And you know, I learned some lessons along the way, side note, giving and receiving. I was receiving all this information and what the masculine tends to usually do is when they get things, they want to give it. They want to do something with it, right? Like you mm. get money, you want to spend it. You get a status, you want to let everyone know what your status is, whatever it is. Yeah. We, we don't just sit space with the receiving, right? So that was a lesson learned and lessons learned, still learning, of course, in the, the feminine masculine dynamic and receiving and giving and all of that. But I just you know, I, I just wanted to share. Just from a genuine place, I just wanted to share and create. And I've been doing it for a long time, but it was just coming from a different place now. I was in so much more integrity, this new version of me, which was also very scary because I was leaving so much behind of my old life and my old identity. Mm. And so mm. one, one thing I do, and, you know, I've just continued that process. I've just been very, very consistent um, with who I am um, on social media in terms of, you know, posting and sharing and all of that posting but sharing like sharing my wisdom my experiences asking big questions sometimes small questions whatever it may be but i write all my content obviously videos are clearly me like it's i i i script everything myself or as i was not scripting anything my videos are all um uh, what's it called unscripted you know mm-hmm. just just raw um i write all my own posts i'm very committed to that and and i and i'm and i'm going to say this very Bluntly, there are some people out there that have massive profiles. And hey, I want to put my hand up here. Like part of me is probably jealous of that as well, right? That have massive profiles <laughs> and they don't really write their own content. They don't create their own content. Now, that's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's not completely real because it presents as if they are. I'm just one of those people, I'll just own it, fucking own it. Like if you're not writing or creating your own content, then own it. That's okay. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, and for you, the way I know you, like the very first word that comes up for me is integrity. You're just a man of integrity. And so when you see that, you're like, that's, that's it, out it, of integrity. It, hurt, it hurts me and it, and it brings up old stuff in me, but it's great because I get to work with those shadows, right? Yes. Because I was very much out of integrity, brother, for a very long time. Mm. Very, very long time, you know? Um, and yeah, it was. It's, it's, it's a personal thing for me. So... I, I, I am very deliberate in, in sharing, creating and writing my own content and speaking from my own experiences and I'm constantly refining that expression, right, in terms of relatability and what I want to say and how I want to say it. and I'm sometimes torn. There's a big part of me that, you know, I started a lot of my, my early blogging, which I mentioned, but a lot of it was also um, sociocultural, uh, socioeconomic and political activism, geopolitical activism and really speaking to what's happening in the collective and there's a big part of me now with what's happening in the world Whereas I'm trying to, I'm trying to, like I have so much to say, and so so much to share, you know, and I and I'm I'm pretty public, I'm public with my opinions or my perspectives if someone asks me, but my platform I'm I'm figuring out is I'm better served helping people help themselves here as opposed to being a massive political activist, which I have that in me, yeah. right, and I'm still. I'm like, ah, oh, what do I use my platform for? And and I really have come to the clarity that this is where my gifts are and I want to stay in this in this space for now. That may change later, but for now this is mm. where I'm at. 
And so that's very, that's very important to me in speaking and expressing from that place. I don't want to get caught down the whirlpool of social media because it can take you to a fucking very dark place, specifically with social comparison and, and not really, you know, always focusing on everything else that's happening outside of you. Mm-hmm. So I have my executive assistant. She is fucking amazing. Mm. She's so valuable. I mean, she's just such a good human being and so adept and just she's amazing, man. Jill is amazing. And so she posts for me. She doesn't write any of my content, of course, like, but she just posts for me. She does all of that. And then I'll go into social. The, the, the idea, it doesn't always work this way, but I'll go into social media once or twice a day to answer as many comments as I can and be, you know, again, in integrity with that and try and respond to as many people as I can. And that's how I try and do it. And, and that's it. I just want to keep expressing. I want to keep growing. I take on what people say, feedback that people give. I reflect on that. I, I'm just in. That's the space that I'm in. And so I'll mainly do that for Instagram, a little bit of on Facebook. Um, that that's that's really a, about it. That's I use social media as a platform for connecting and communication, and sharing, just sharing some, I don't know, sharing some love, man, in a world that is just. There's a lot of wholeness in the world and love and clarity and beauty and joy and all of that. And there's a lot of um, disconnection, disparity and suffering at the moment. I don't think this era is any different to previous eras. But I think with the connectivity of, of social media and the internet, it brings to awareness a lot more than what we would normally or have in the past been aware of. And so we're flooded with and overwhelmed with so much information but so much negative information as well, right? So I want to I want to be that person that's. It's not about I'm not a love and light. I mean I am a love and light person, but I play in the shadows often. I, I'm a both person. It's not an either or, all, right? I'm I'm not a, a doom and gloom. I'm not a only love and light, rainbows, unicorns, and and pot of gold here. It's not. It's it's we're all of it. That's that's life, right? But what I want to bring into the world is opportunities, tools, techniques, real life. Um, experiences for people to heal themselves to take themselves to the next level of their own evolution and provide comfort safety strategy um, opportunity the space to do that and that's 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 how i see social media more and more and i'm becoming less and less detached to it that's for sure yeah that's that's beautiful (laughs) and that makes a ton of sense just how i know you that 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 all aligns perfectly i love that you bring up the political stuff, because it's, um, for me, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I feel you, you and I share a lot of the same kind of feelings around a lot of that stuff. And it's hard for a lot of people to receive. Um, you definitely get the people who are like, fuck yeah, brother. But, um, so I try to, when I post about those things, um, I try to do it with that in mind. And I don't Mm. really, I don't sugarcoat it, yeah. um, but I'm not trying to be super triggering either. Yeah, I, I want I want to be like you know, and I use my stories and as it's a bit more personal of what I do, you know, as opposed to the, to the teachings. And um, like I just want people to think for themselves. Yes, and I want people to keep me accountable. Fucking get me thinking for myself. Critical thinking. You know, I had a lady come up to me, an older lady. She must have been in her sixties or seventies. I couldn't tell because she had thirteen masks on. At Whole Foods the other day, <laughs> at Whole Foods the other day, and she walked up to me. She broke the six foot barrier distance. Note the Australian sarcasm in my voice. But anyway, <laughs> uh, she broke the she broke the six foot barrier distance, and she said to me, "Why are you even wearing a fucking mask if you're not wearing it properly?" Because I had it just below my nose. Yeah, and I just stared at her. I just looked at her, and I just looked at her. I didn't say anything. I just looked at her. And then I went back to picking my avocados and she came back and she just kept going on and on. And I looked at her for a little longer and I said, wow. Well, because she asked then, you know, why are you even wearing a mask again? I said, because I'd like to fucking shop here because that's their rules and I'm respecting the establishment. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's irrelevant. I want to shop here and I don't feel like getting in a fucking gunfight with a with a security guard who's got a, got a gun on his on his hip for whole food just in case someone's not wearing their mask 
And she kept going on and on and on and just wouldn't let up. And I just kept looking at her and I thought, I thought to myself, well, I can't believe this woman is, A, doing this. And she started telling me about her credentials, like she's an immunologist or she's a virologist or something. I'm like, well, she should fucking know better that they don't work. <laughs> what the fuck? So you know what I said to her? I said, maybe you should put another six masks on the two that you're wearing. She had two masks. She was just another six masks and I just walked away. And she just kept carrying on and swearing at me. And I'm like, do you, I mean, seriously, I'm a 185 year, uh, 185 pound um, male who's athletic and very primed and you're picking a fight. I mean, not that I'm going to ever do anything to her or be violent or anything like that, but like, what, are you that are you that entrenched in, entrenched in your ideological beliefs? And if your ideological belief is so accurate, me having my mask here just below my nose is not going to be a detriment to you. Like, are you so opinionated you have to share that? Are you worried that is she worried that you're going to get it because she's fucking masked she up? She was very not nice to. to, <laughs> to, to she, she didn't come up to me and touch me on my shoulder and say. So she didn't say I think so your I'm mask fell down. I'm I don't want you to get for you. COVID. If she said that, I would have been, oh, thank you, my love, thank you. I mean, yes. I have an affinity for older people because I looked after my grandparents. So I'm, not, I'm one of those people that very much re respects and reveres the elders. And I feel bad just using the word, I didn't swear, I didn't tell her to go fuck herself or anything like right. that. Right. I used the word fucking in a sentence. But she was loading it up beforehand. So I thought, oh, she must be in her vocabulary then. So <laughs> yes. she's good to go. Yeah. And so it's in my vocabulary, so it may as well exchange. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> And I just can't, I just couldn't believe it. And and it got me thinking about what what the division that we're experiencing in the world. I'm not gonna say it's worse than what it was or it's 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 better or what, I don't I don't know, but there's just so much division right now, brother. And so when we go back to that conversation about social media, where do I feel I'm best served? I think it's in the space that I'm in, in the lane that I'm in. Yeah. Like I have a perspective on many different things. Maybe it's I mean, I don't even know what deems to be accurate or inaccurate. Maybe it's accurate. Maybe it's helpful. Maybe it's not. I don't know. And I'm happy to go there. I'm very, uh, I want to say, um, real in that space. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, and I get I get pushback, man. When I put something in my stories, like, I think I put one the other day. Like, is that, is that the old image of that 1960s guy? He's, he's doing that. You know the one, you know, do you know the image I'm talking about? And he's, and he's put his hand out. And then there's all these memes that come with it. Anyway, one of the memes was, um, stop. I can't, I can't speak with you. I, I, I don't speak brainwashed. You know, like, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> fuck yeah. It was funny. But I'm, and then I'll get, I'll get in, in the DMs and, and in the, um, you know, in my DMs, I can't believe you're speaking to this. Just stick to, stick to relationships and what you know. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Like, okay. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that's it. And I, and I think I, I try to approach, I don't always nail it, but I try to approach it like, hey, isn't this interesting? Like, look at some, like some of the stuff that JP puts out. It's like, isn't this an interesting video? Because yeah, I know he does deep research on, on, on the videos before he puts them out. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's a trust in there. Because I know him, too. I, yeah. I trust that he is in integrity with that stuff. But it, it's, yeah, you definitely, for me, yeah, I, I just, look, I'm not going to post, I don't think, about vaccine not vaccine any of that stuff because people again it's it's people don't want to believe this but the 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 powers that be they want us distracted over all this shit mask no mask vaccine no vaccine whatever it is um they want us entrenched in that stuff we'll police ourselves we won't see what the fuck's going on because when you start to Again, I, 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 I don't really want to go there, but anybody, please just tune in to <laughs> my brother, Del Big Tree in the High Wire, and you'll just get fucking straight information, well-researched. If you want to know about any of the stuff that's going on, I, I highly recommend that. So hopefully Lindsay will put that in the show notes and you can just click over to it because it's been a, a great resource for me to get an understanding. And again, he... Double, triple check, uh, fact, check, fact checks, everything. And I know wh where his soul is. I know him. Yeah. He man, I, I hear you, man. I, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of credible, quote unquote, credible research that, and we'll just use masks as an example. I think it's a fucking trivial conversation anyway, but we'll just use it as an example. That states that under certain conditions, certain circumstances with the 
uh, appropriate material, masks can be protective from certain things. And then there's a shit ton of research. That, I don't know if you use the term shit ton here in Australia. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Shit ton of research that says masks are extremely damaging to the health. And it doesn't actually help from protecting us from any viral loading outside of our, um, you know, exteroceptively outside of our skin, right? And so what do you believe? I don't know. I really don't. But what I do know is this as well, that, you know, when we, when we bring to light alternative conversations that aren't in the mainstream media, mm. often people are, are called conspiracy theorists. You don't need, it's not, it's less about conspiracy and more about systemic structure. And so, you know, you got, I'm on a soapbox here, so I might as well fucking take soapbox advantage of it. Soapbox <laughs> away, brother. Stand way the fuck up there. <laughs> so, so, you know, you look at our socioeconomic models. You look at, and this isn't about whether capitalism is better than communism or socialism or, or any, any form of um, being better than a socioeconomic model. But the dominant system that we live in today is, it is a capitalistic model, particularly in the Western paradigm, Right. Now, that's morphed over time, well beyond, I think, what Adam Smith's intention was of it many years ago. And so as it's morphed and changed, there are certain rules that we have to play by if we want to be in this system. And so when a corporation is doing its best to survive or meet quarterly profits or shareholder satisfaction, and it, and it prioritizes that value almost at any other cost, whether it's the health and um, well-being of their employees or um, considering environmental degradation as a byproduct of what their corporation is doing in the world, how they're extracting, distributing, processing raw materials and resources and distributing energy and so forth. It's not a conspiracy. It's part of the game. It's the beast doing what it does as its role in the game. It's not conspiracy. When you're talking about the powers that be, there are there is a hierarchy of wealth distribution. There is a hierarchy of leadership at a global level, but also at a more micro level, like whether it be you know um, uh, town, city, state, na nation, you know, continent, whatever. Mm. And so we just have to look at how are we operating and what are the rules that we're creating for, it? and we're all part of it. But we are all part yeah. of this. And so I think it's 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 not about blaming. But it's also about looking, okay, well, let's look at the collective model that we're at and let's look at our individual contributions. So I'm, I'm a big fan of grassroots and top-down. There's no point in having a grassroots roots movement if the top-down, if leadership, whether it be global or national, whatever, is not on board. And there's no point in having a top-down approach and making all these changes widespread in culture and society if grassroots, the people, aren't involved. They're not bought in, Right. We got to make some big changes in the world, in our world, man. And it's well beyond masks. It's a lot of it is, oh, I mean, it's a it's a very long conversation. Well, and the problem is, is as you said, we're in the second model. It's fucking top down and indoctrination. And if you don't, we're going to shame you, and yep. we're going to put what neighbor versus neighbor. And it, it just again, the, we're going to police ourselves. And we're fortunate that we live, you know, we choose to live here, but we live in a place that is much more free thinking and much more supportive within the community. I hope it stays that way. I mean, I think that I think that's our community though, brother. I think we're, we're, we're an anomaly. I think we may I be sheltered, yeah, from yeah, the- We're the, a rarity. Yeah. And I, I, I hope, and I'm not a big fan of the word hope unless it's intelligent hope, but I, I'm, not, I'm hoping, I'm not hopelessly hoping here that <laughs> it remains that way where we have that level of, um, you know, autonomous expression and, and I mean, man. I mean, are we free, Cal? Are we are we really fucking free? You know, like, I mean, let's think, I mean, even just from our own thoughts and our own unconscious belief systems and the own and, and our own limiting beliefs that we place on ourselves, like what is what what freedom are we actually talking about? You know, I mean, and we can we can speak to vaccines. This is a very personal thing for me because I have family and friends in Australia. Like, I have family and friends. I'm grounded here. Like this is U the US is my home, and I love being here. And I have my brother and my niece that I haven't even seen yet. Man, she was born a few months ago. Mm. She was born. Sorry, she was born nearly a year ago, and I haven't seen her because I can't get to Australia, and I'm not going to be able to go there. And I know this for a fact because they're not letting anyone in unless you have a vaccine. 
So I'm being forced to have a vaccine to see the people that I love dearly if I want to go there. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, that's a freedom. I mean, we're talking about freedom of speech on platforms, you know, whether it's a social media platform mm. or, you, you know, another platform that, that, have, that have platforms that have been shut down because you're saying something that is not agreeable to the ethos and ideology of a corporation or organization that is responsible for having that platform. And that is also influence. You know, lobbying works both ways, to some degree, mm-hmm. right? And, and and I'm not. That's probably not a, um, a intellectual definition that I'm giving. But for me personally, it works both ways. I mean, there's collusion with government and corporation, and corporation and government. Again, are they being conspiracists? No, they're they're trying to maximize their position in a game that has winners and fucking losers. Yes. It's really not a big conspiracy. And they're just connected. You just like you went to college with the guy. You, you just build these connections. And when when you don't have a, a, a tremendous moral compass, things get a little slippery. And then it gets Very. a little sli- And it's like you can just see how it happens. Justifications are easily, easily made. I remember, I, again, I'll just use myself as an example. I don't, I'm not, don't claim superiority or, or godhead over anything or anyone. When I was... For most of my life, I was a serial cheater. I was, you know, infidelity in pretty much every relationship, right? Except for my last two, the one before my wife and my current relationship with my wife. Um, and I, I justified my actions so well and so easily. Hmm. So mm. well and so easily. And that is just a thing with me. Like can you imagine when there's even more at stake, when there's money and there's status and there's there's obligation and responsibilities at stake, you know, you know, with with corruption and, and in the infiltration of influence and racketeering and all of that still occurs. People people that live this is my perspective, and I've I've travelled a lot. I've been to Nearly 80 countries in my life. Damn, oh, yeah. what's 70, up? Yeah, 77, I think. Pretty 76, 77, 78, something like that. Yeah, I don't mm. count. But I've been in a lot of different places, and I continue to travel, um, or I'd love to continue to travel. <laughs> um, but, you know, and I do. But I've seen a lot of, for lack of a better term, bad shit. I've seen some pretty horrific things in developing nations and, and, and other places, and just even just in my, in my youth growing up, I, being with gangs and other, just being mixing with not great people, right? We we have it in general really well, those that are affluent enough, like in the middle class to be able to have that. Yeah, sure, we have press, pressures and psychological and emotional pressures and collective pressures, but for the most part, we, we have it really, really well. Agreed. Right? And we take that for granted, I think, sometimes. And what's really important to remember is that in the systems that we've created for ourselves, it's less about equity and more about individual advancement. Mm. Even if that means the advancement of the corporation. Oh, right? I love this. Yeah. So, so you know, yes. Say cla- that again, just so people really, really, that lands for them. It's less about equity or socially distributed equity. And, and you know, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jordan Peterson speaks amazingly to this, far better than me, and he's far more educated in this space. I was just talking with Boyd about this yeah. yesterday. I think yeah. this, this principle. He, he's brilliant, right? And so it's more, it's it's less about social equity. And again, like someone that's listening to me may think, oh, well, you know, you're you're a socialist, or you're a you know you're a communist, or you want government to t- have control and distribute resources equally. And I like, no, no, not actually, I don't. No, that's not. It. It's less about the isms, right? But what I was saying was to repeat what he said is. It's less about that equity piece and more about individual advancement. And that's not a bad or good thing. Let me be very clear about that. It's just the thing that we live in in this society. That's what drives a lot of us collectively, organizationally, and individually. So we just gotta, we've got to figure out like, from a perspective of the caring and carrying capacity of our earth and the earth's resources and what's in our atmosphere as well from – um, you know the precious metals that surround us, and um, uh, energy, energy creation, distribution that 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 creates well-being and 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 health and wealth and wellness and all of that. 
are our current practices sustainable? And then you can go ahead and say, okay, what does sustainable mean? The next 10 years, 100 years? You know, you, you speak to s- certain um, traditional cultures and they would say, whatever actions you take now, it's for the next seven generations. Like it's going to mm. be for the next seven, at least seven to eight generations, some of 10 generations. Is that what's sustainable? Is it, are we thinking, in, you know, a thousand years ahead? Like what does that look like? And, and that's an arbitrary term, but it's beyond just quarterly profits and return on investment at a quarterly level, right? And I'm not saying that money's bad. I'm not saying the monetary system is bad. I think we just get an opportunity to do some tweaking now because there's a lot of disparity. There's a lot. And if you, when I say you, I'm talking about leadership that is in an affluent position, if the role was reversed and you were drinking cow's piss because you needed some liquid, because that's what happens in the world sometimes. You've, I mean, I've seen a lot of images. I haven't seen it personally, but I've seen l- many images where children, um, they have that, uh, what's that What's that condition called? Distended belly yeah, thingy. Yeah, and, yeah. And I've seen videos and, and um, images of, of children not having food and you know, just dying, man, dying. And that is that is a byproduct of the world we live in. And if, if we were in that position, wouldn't we want more equity? Mm. I think we're complacent. This is where the challenge piece comes in as well, right? I think we're complacent. I think we're very, very blessed. And maybe I'll just speak for myself. I'm very blessed. And sometimes I get complacent as well. And I don't know what the answers are, man. I don't. I don't, I don't know if giving a million bucks to a charity every year or you know, 50% of your net worth or 10% of your net worth, I don't know if that is sustainable, brother, because... You know, the administration costs on most charitable organisations is like minimum 70%. Yeah. So every dollar you give, 30% is actually going to the people that need it, if yeah. that. Like, there's just there's just inefficiencies in our systems. You know, and again, we can bang on about this over and over again. There are far pe- there are far more people out there that are way better suited to, than me to speak to this. Um, same, same. Yeah, but yeah. I know, I'm glad you brought it up. And one of the, I think one of my kids had mentioned to me that that um, at the wall, at a wall somewhere, these Ecuadorian, this Ecuadorian family, like basically threw their two kids over the wall and like fucking left. And it's like, isn't it interesting that so many people think they have it so bad here in the United States and our younger generation is being fucking indoctrinated to think that this is a bad place and that's your another, ancestors are issue. Is really bad and in, in, in all this. And so this generation is growing up hating the U.S., also very entitled very entitled but i'm like how bad is it here if someone is willing to give up their kids to give them a chance at a better life like how bad would it have to be here for me for me to give up my kids yeah. somewhere where i would never see them again and holy then, fuck yeah and let's be real like we're, we're talking about one aspect of the u.s we have the highest incarceration rate here we have homelessness is growing more and more and more every day, particularly in major cities. Um, you know, I and mean, I've witnessed this with my own eyes. Los Angeles is becoming a fucking cesspool. Um, mm. And not because of the homeless people. Let me be very clear about that. These are people that need somewhere to say. It's becoming a cesspool because of political corruption. Side note, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it's pretty fucking evident. There's no conspiracy about it. Like, it's just really evident. It's not hard to connect dots. I mean, I spend my life connecting dots that are very difficult to connect for Mm -hmm. people's internal selves it's not very difficult to connect some dots outside right and we you know know, here in the u.s there is so much suffering here in 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 the western world and and we've got it really good because you know we're not in war-torn syria or we're not in war-torn you know wherever there are wars yeah. currently raging right now or civil wars or conflict or um guerrilla warfare you know we don't we're not quite uh, and, and granted we may have fucking had something to do with it but well, that's here's another thing the, here's the difference you and i and the other citizens of america didn't have anything to do with it it was the fucking government and whoever else the cia whoever's involved and so it's like I, I've gone through that period where, where I felt this shame about being an American because of all the bad shit we've done around the world. But it's like, I didn't fucking do it, nor would I. 
I don't think. No, I don't. I don't think you would either. But here's something. Here's something to fuck your head. Oh, right. Okay. Here's something interesting. So, firstly, again, I just want to caveat this, not because I care what people think of me, because I want to be in integrity. And this is, I'm not a substance or subject matter expert in this space, like some of the people that we know that you know delve into history, in the richness of history and political history and socioeconomic history and all of that, right? Geopolitical history, particularly. However, here's here's something that's interesting. You wouldn't do that and you didn't do that. Like what's happened in terms of the the hands that certain governments or corporations that have, have um, played in um, accelerating warfare around the world. I mean, it's not – war's a big industry. If money – we live in a monetary-based system and who makes the most quote-unquote wins and winning is very intrinsic within us all, war generates a lot of money. This isn't conspiracy. There are, there are certain people that have agendas. Guess what, people? We all have agendas. You have unconscious and conscious agendas. This is part of the human psyche and part of what makes you, you. And corporations follow suit as well. We all have an agenda or multiple agendas. And so that being true, um, and yes, you didn't make those choices, but didn't you? I didn't make those choices, but didn't I? If I'm perpetuating a particular lifestyle, and we'll call it materialism, Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call it ensuring that the economy is moving. And we're part of that economy and we're part of that growth. We, can't, we cannot diffuse ourselves of the responsibility of that. We are contributing to the world that we live in in some way or another. Some people far more direct than us, of course. But we are contributing to an industry, to a social construct, to a culture through our attention. You know, like you often see TV shows on, on TV and it's like, oh, I can't believe they actually have this, but we're watching it. There are millions of people, 100,000 people, that there's a demand for it. So if there's demand there, it's going to happen. We use the US as an example. Preaches and speaks to freedom deeply. And the values, I mean, freedom is, uh, sorry, the US is the last frontier when it comes to freedom. Yes. And that's a very arbitrary term and a very complex one, right? But, very funny. Yeah. I didn't realize how complex it was until the last year. It's like, holy very shit. Very much so. Very layered. Very, very layered, right? And very nuanced. And so our, our lifestyles, the things that we say and do, how we interact with the world and with each other at a micro level and a macro level in our communities, in our societies, etc., what we pay our attention to, it contributes to that ethos of justification, okay? Because it's easily justified. It's easily justified for a, a government to make a decision that's on behalf well, – that's basically one of the reasons why they're there is they make decisions on behalf of the greater collective that they think is right and they justify it based on – what is visible in the world. And we're part of that visibility. We are part of that whole. And so at some level, everything that happens in the world, and this may be a mind fuck for a lot of people, but we are responsible for it. There's a spectrum of that though, of directly, indirectly. Yeah. And you know, and and but I, I don't want, I want to be really clear, like I don't want to disempower us. There it is. Okay. Okay. I want to empower us to, to say the choices that I make actually matter. You know, you hear at election time, ah, it's one vote, I can't be bothered voting. It's only one vote. What if every person said that? All of a sudden it's not just one vote, is it? Yeah. If every person said that, think, think, and every person did that, every person thought it wouldn't happen because – I don't think the mathematics behind it would allow it to a lot of averages, whatever. But, fucking, but if every person did that and no one, I mean, you're using voting as an example, and no one voted, then your one vote matters, doesn't it? Your voice matters. Your actions matter. How, how, you, how you treat another person on the street matters. How you recycle matters. I mean, that's another conversation as well. I mean, we, we call it recycling and, and garbage and landfill, but... The recycling plants can't even hold proper recycling. It's another fucking conversation. But I was wondering about that. I've been very leery of that for a number of years. I'm like, do they even fucking do anything with this? How are they sorting it out? Depends the on the city. I don't. I don't think Austin has the capacity to actually sort. It. I've got to look a little deeper into that because <laughs> because one of my, one of my master's degrees in, is in environmental science and okay. ecology sustainability. Right. So I have a passion for that plant, for that as well. So you know, it's we 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 are feeding into the system everything we do and. Sometimes it's really easy to get lost. Okay. Yes, that was a mind fuck. So I appreciate it. <laughs> how do you reconcile it for you? Like, how do you, like, understanding that and it's all the things. And that's the, I, I love that about it. There's this element that we have agency mm. 
And, and then you, you, you got to the point where it's like, if I feel that way, that I have nothing to do with it, I'm completely disempowered. I can't. Yeah. And you're helpless. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're just hopeless. Like you, yeah. because it's like you're diffusing your responsibility. It's like, well, I can't do anything, so I'll let someone else do it. Yeah. So how do we how do we reconcile that? Part of the answer is I, I really don't know, and because um, it's a lot of trial and error. Because we've built this massive machine and we've created a rod for our own backs in terms of how systemically we function, and that's not a cop out answer because there is there is something else to, that I would add to that. For me just take responsibility for everything that is in your locus of control. So, you know, I refer back to Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Sure, it's right behind you. So good. Oh, you've got Iron John here as well. That's oh, on the other side of you. Oh, where is it there? No, further back. Further back. There it is, the blue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, there. Oh. Um, yes, and so I refer back to that story, right, where he's about to kill himself and he says my life's work is all about essentially what can I control? Like no one can rob me of my peace, of my internal state. Like if I do this, I'm giving my power away. And so I would say that as individuals, we have to focus on what is in our locus of control. What can we be responsible for? Whether that's healing some past trauma that's unresolved, whether that's choosing to treat people better, whether that's choosing to be more giving, whether that's choosing to be more receiving, because that's a, that's mm. an art and a gift in itself. When you, you know, you come and you want to do something for me, and I don't let you do it, that that puts a barrier between us, and that hurts you. It doesn't just hurt me. So learning to receive, it's can you just be responsible for you? Now, here's the thing: that may sound very isolated. You may think, well, we're just running around doing our own thing for ourselves, and it's selfish. No, it's not, because in a relationship right, you and your wife, you are responsible for 100% of your 50% and she holds that same intention. There's some trust here that's involved and then you both bring that intention to the third entity being the relationship. Guess what happens? Growth. As individuals and in the relationship because you, you get to ask, how are my actions affecting this person? How are my actions improving the, the relationship? If that's your goal, you know, that's your, your embodiment experience of growth. And you get to ask, how is my partner helping me grow? How is my partner contributing to the relationship? Now, if we're all asking these questions and we're all responsible for ourselves, but also, of course, the well-being of others, I think there's going to be some pretty big shift. I think we, we start to infuse responsibility instead of defuse responsibility. I think that's a starting point. Yeah. And 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 here's the thing, man. This is done with great difficulty. I don't humanity has never been at a point before where there's nearly eight billion people on the planet with such disparity, yet such high levels of communication and connection as well, like through the through the internet and through social media and through other forms of, of digital communication and tech and blockchain and everything else. Uh, we are we are rapidly accelerating our technology. But is our morality accelerating? I think we're asking the same questions that we used to ask two, three, four, five, six thousand years ago, maybe beyond. I don't, I don't even know how accurate history is. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that as an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think it's it's really just start with self. I think we have and to, and then go. Yeah, because that's like, what we have. It, control it, don't over. try to like tackle. It's it's classic. I, the, when this, when I hear that, the first thing that comes to mind is the four agreements. Mm. And um, I remember reading it the first couple times that I read it and one of the things he talks about in the beginning is we've made all these agreements knowingly or unknowingly but you know now it's the time to unlock them and my whole fucking achiever mindset was like I, I don't even know what the agreements are how am I ever going to unlock all of the agreements how am I going to get to the end of that how am I going to accomplish that mm -hmm. and then like finally I read it a couple years later and I was like oh do the one thing when the agreement comes up look at it, unlock it, move on. And it's just like keeping this like one step, follow the breadcrumbs, just do your part. In, and then as the, you know, maybe there's an amplification, but it's relationships with other people, with the earth. And then the opportunities start to come about where you can start to make those changes. And hopefully there's that kind of, 
you know, it's not necessarily a butterfly effect, but where you're mm -hmm. starting to affect change in others and inspiring them, or you're being inspired by somebody. There's this whole collective that's starting to move because we're in a relationship together. I, there's two things that come from what you just said, and I, lo and I love that. And the first thing is, you know, we're, we're here, we're two guys, two friends that are having a conversation and expressing some perspectives. If you resonate, run with it and explore it further. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's okay. You're allowed to have your opinion. Like, yes. You know, Godspeed. It really doesn't fucking matter, right? <laughs> so, like, yes. you know, the other part of it is, well, go fuck yourself. And you can tell yes. me to go fuck myself too. Like, like, that doesn't really matter either, right? Yes. And, and the other part is, is this. I often think about, <laughs> you, know, you know, when I first started this journey of really wanting to be an impact in the world, which, by the way, started when I was you know, six years old. I wanted to be United Nations Secretary General. Ooh, we could use someone like you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm pretty, pretty volatile. Uh, maybe some aspects of me. You can't be bought. I hope. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, well, that depends. No? Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to be because, um, you know, I, I was suffering in my childhood. But I'd, I'd watch a lot of um, National Geographic and uh, watch TV with my grandparents. I mentioned that to you, right? And I'd see a lot of kids suffering in the world, you know. And I thought, well, this isn't fair. And uh, I saw the United Nations. I'm like, well, maybe. If I could be the president of the United Nations is what I thought, right? That means like I'm the leader of the world and I could help all these people. Like that thing. I've come to see that geopolitically and economically, the United Nations is a little different to what I thought it was. Mm. But I, I, I have this, I, you know, I, I think about that and, and when I started on this journey, I wanted to impact a billion people, as many people as possible, everyone that I could. But my, our brains can't fathom that. It just can't. You, you know, I mean, I can't remember what the, it's not, What's the Dunbar's 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 law Dunbar's, Dunbar's rule, rule something like that about 150 people right yeah. so there's an extensive study that's been done in that maybe it's give or take a few more whatever but realistically you think about it in your life like how many close intimate meaningful relationships can you hold at one given time I mean it could be a few but it's not going to be a billion nope. it's not going to be a million you know it's, it's just it's, it's, it's not possible it's inconceivable for our brains structurally to even begin to understand it's like to, to even attempt to begin to understand how many stars are in our solar system, uh, sorry, in our galaxy, there's one star in our solar system, but in our galaxy, in our universe. Like it's just inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Grains of sand in the world, more than the grains of sand in, on, in, in every ocean in the world. It's just, it's out of control. Just so, it's so difficult to fathom. Mm. Num numerically, we can't. And so what you were saying then for me is start with your family. Start with your close circle of friends. Be the best version of yourself for you and then for them. And that's what I attempt to do. And, and sometimes I don't do it well. You know, I, I can say some really wonderful things on social media, in my writing, in my videos and expression. And then at home, I'm a fucking asshole. Mm. Like I, do, I don't always get it right. Mm. But I want to try. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I want to focus more and more on that in, in my community. Yeah, so I still want to impact lots of people if I can, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions, whatever. I'm not thinking small. Like, I'm still good for that. I'm just not attached to it. Uh -huh. that, that's the that's thing, it. man. We can't be attached to it because if we're so obsessed and attached to it, then we miss out presence. Yes. Quote, unquote, serotonin. Um, being grateful for what's happening now. Yes. And, and I think we get to focus on that in, in our immediate communities. That, to me, is pretty special. I love that. That's perfect. That's beautiful. Wow. Okay. I was going to add to that, but there's nothing needed to be added to that. What I would say is, we're going to close with this. Um, you said something to me, I don't know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. It was about the, the masculines waking up. The masculines becoming more conscious. The masculine is changing. And... It's affecting the feminine. And, and, and so what I would say is, because they're not used to it. They're like, who the fuck are these guys? Yeah. We're not used to this kind of awakened uh, gender. I guess it's not gender. The awakened, we'll just keep it at masculine. What do you feel like is, um, what can you say to the women out there who just aren't sure what to make of this, whether they can trust it or not? or And obviously there's individual cases, but what you've experienced and what you're seeing in this community in particular, like what, what kind of w words of experience could you share with them so that they can 
more ready, readily receive what's happening? Yeah, that, that's a really powerful question from my perspective, brother, and I, I appreciate you asking that. I was asked a, um, a similar question in reference to men's work, women's work, and then coming together work um, not long ago. And it, I think it's very important. And I think it's a, I, I think it's a case-by-case analysis. And so there's many moving parts. This is, let me do my best to um, uh, simplify it and, and just really itemize everything that's necessary here to answer your question directly, uh, compassion and non-judgment. And before uh, a woman can get to that place to, to be receiving this new masculine that is coming into the world in a different way, and some aspects of the masculine is confused as well, and that's probably a conversation for another time as it's a it's a rabbit hole but there is let's focus on the masculine that is growing and that is adding a lot more value and is um more more inclusive in a healthier way yet still in um healthy exclusivity as well in terms of being in sovereignty and and leading and being in power but not being forceful in one's power Mm. so you, you know how how does a woman receive that and so there's a lot of collective wounding that has been done to the feminine and all females and that's that is in the collective psyche of our humanity specifically um, with women and so to get to that place of non-compassion and judgment forgiveness has to take place of self of others of the generational pain that has been transferred physiologically not just spiritually and emotionally yeah, explain and culturally. that so this when a, when a woman uh, is giving birth, uh, not giving birth, but when she has a fetus, at 20 weeks, and, and I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure these numbers are corrected by, by memory. At 20 weeks, um, that, when that fetus, that baby's 20 weeks old, um, has all the eggs they will ever have. That's right. That's pretty, pretty impressive. And so whilst those eggs decrease over time, and um, our sperm count somewhat increases over time, basically, as men. It's interesting. But um, as those eggs decrease over time, one of those eggs that was in there at 20 weeks is going to be that baby if that woman chooses to have a baby at some point. That's right. So there's an intergenerational weaving there of what's happening emotionally and, and, and culturally in that woman's life is affecting not only the child genealogically, but also the grandchild. That's right. The grandchild comes. Yes. It's very interesting, right? So th- there's that. And so there's a lot of generational trauma, again, physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, culturally as well that's taken place. Now, before that woman can get to the forgiveness, she needs to feel. She needs to expel the trauma. She needs to, um, not just she, like all of us as individuals, an individual thing, by the way, we have, to, we have to close the trauma loop. We can't leave it open. Because when we experience trauma, pain, uh, disconnection sexual abuse physical abuse whatever it may be you know being told we're wrong interpreting people that love us saying that we've done something wrong and then making ourselves wrong for it whatever we have to close that loop so we have to in order to close that loop a number of things have to happen but we have to be able to regulate ourselves regulate our neurology our biochemistry our psychology and in order to regulate ourselves we have to feel safe enough to be able to regulate ourselves to then deal with that trauma so I'm connecting some dots here, right? Mm-hmm. Are you with yeah. me? You with me so far? Yeah, I am. Okay, good. And so as we're doing that, that woman, specific to this question, has to create a space for herself and also be surrounded by others to help her feel safe to clear out that trauma. Say clear out maybe is in the right term, but to deal with it, to begin to deal with it and to to work with it, to to make the unknown known so that she can regulate herself more regularly. Then she will be able to welcome the masculine in a different way with a new lens because she's doing her inner work. Now, simultaneously, men need to do the same thing. So it's not just this is a woman's responsibility. Men need to do the same thing and they need to show up and show that they're safe. Now, when you're talking about bringing men and women together to do that work, if there isn't a baseline of healing that has been met within the individuals, and the mediator or the, the, the transformative people in that, in that uh, group, 10 people or 50 people or whatever, the leaders of that group that are bringing this, doing this deeper psycho-emotional, psychosocial, spiritual work together, 
if they're not grounded and if they can't hold space, in other words, if they haven't gone through their own stuff enough, there's going to be projections and it's going to cause more harm than good. So men have to do their work in witness to other men, as you know. You know, you know, we, we know this firsthand, right? Yes. There's something very powerful and special that happens there that diffuses shame, that gives us enough clarity and wisdom to be able to take that to our partners, to the women in our lives, our daughters, our mothers, our wives, or whatever. I would say that big parts of your revelation are also coming from the fact that you are being witnessed by other men in a way that you haven't before. Yes, big time. Big truth. And so compassion non judgment is the immediate answer, but I've just stripped back a lot of what needs to happen and it's an ongoing process. And some groups may not be ready for it. Others may be, individuals may be. I believe working together and, and you know, yes, sister circles are great. Yes, men's gatherings are great, but coming together with men and women, it's absolutely necessary and it's the way we're going. It's, it, and it's happening already. But it, it needs to be more of it and we can't rush it. Because not that men are catching up, it's not that they're catching up, but in a sense they are. I mean, I'm not, and and I'm not, I want to be very clear, men aren't less than. There's not, not a less than thing here at all. It's that we haven't been exposed to this work, this emotional intelligence before. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we've lost track with our, our community. Remember what we said at the beginning about, I've been very blessed to have amazing men in my life. Many men don't. And part of our evolution has been been growing up with a band of brothers and men by our side, hunting, protecting, serving, exploring, creating. Mm. We've lost that in our society, the concrete jungles that we live in, the isolation that we experience, the immense pressure, socio-cultural, socio-economic pressure that we face. Like we've lost a lot of our, our, our deep bonds and connections. We, it's not appropriate for men to emote or be in touch with their feelings or what's actually happening for them. Nothing wrong with stoicism. I promote stoicism as, as a form of healthy masculinity, but not in the way that maybe some people think. It's not about suppressing our emotions. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's about um, being resilient and being articulate with our emotions when we need to, knowing ourselves well enough to know when and how to emote in certain situations. But we're not taught how to do that. And so there's this complete re-education that's taking place, man. Um, and we've got... Older men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s that are wanting to be initiated as men by men like me mm-hmm. because I'm, I'm in this work and, and, and men like my friend Jetty, for example, who takes people on vision quests and so forth. Um, our, our brother Obur with Sacred Sons and these types of initiations because our generation to some extent is taking more responsibility for the rite of passage that men require that is essential for men. Women have a very clear, distinct biological rite of passage. That is their menstrual cycle. And they go from being a girl to being a woman. Men don't have that. We don't have that. Yes, we go through puberty. Yes, we grow, etc. But we don't have that distinct biological rite of passage that is just, oh, now I know who I am. So we need that culturally and that art has been lost. And again, I could bang on about this for a long time but hmm. i hope that answers your your question yeah amazing and i guess instead of closing with that that leads us to the work that you and christine and preston and alexi are doing right now you want to speak yeah, to yeah, that yeah for sure absolutely We're very exciting um so elementum coaching institute elementum coaching institute.com essentially you know there's four of us we have combined over 50 years of experience of coaching experience um, you know, very deep visceral coaching experience. And, and we're four coaches that very strongly believe in doing your own work. Like do your own work to be a better coach. And essentially what it is is that. It's a coaching institute. We train coaches how to be better coaches, how to be more grounded in their own, in their own selves, how to be able to interact with their clients in a more effective way, how to deal with trauma and, and somatics and how to use the body and leverage the body in such a way that actually promotes healing. Is that what I spoke about earlier, about mm. that physiological regulation? And we're, just, we're creating a community of people, like-minded, like-hearted people that are really interested in the welfare, well-being and wellness of their own selves but also their clients. So this is the first year that we launched it. Um, we hit capacity within five days, 90 coaches within five days. We capped it there. I was going to say, is it an ongoing enrollment or how, there's, so is there another one, round? At this t- Yeah, at this time, one enrollment per year at, yeah. at this point. So next enrollment is in March. We're already taking um, 
uh, people, we already have people on the wait list. We already have people that are March of next in. year. March of next year, yeah. Yeah. Do you have, okay, so for people listening right now who aren't part of the 90, <laughs> um, get, what, get, get in now, early, early bird. And okay. Se- secure your spot. <laughs> what, what else What else is out there for them to, to work with you or to work oh, with yeah. Christine? Of course, yeah. So um, one-on-one coaching, I do pod coaching, group coaching, two to four people. And then um, I also do one-on-one deep dive coaching as well. Um, we have a lot of different programs. So, um, you know, depending on where you're at in your own life, um, in June, which is early June. We haven't got the date exactly yet. And I've got to give you the URL to put in the um, in the link, which yep. I'm excited about. I just can't remember what the URL is. Christine and I are doing a relationship weekend. So Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday, Saturday Sunday day, two and a half days. Yeah, this June. Here virtual, in Austin. Virtual, it's virtual. Okay, gotcha. You can join from anywhere in the world, um, full of relationship tools, techniques. You don't have to be in a relationship to take this course, mm-hmm. um, but it's going to be powerful. So we're excited about that. So we've got that coming up. And, you know, Christine and I also work with couples as well together. Okay, yeah. great. And then I was going to say, like, what's been, what's been the biggest challenge with, uh, with starting uh, Elementum? Oh. Maintaining the integrity. You know, maintaining it because we, we have very high expectations of ourselves as individuals, but as a group as well, and we're all very high achievers. Um, and it's maintaining, it's pivoting as we're, you know, as we're, we're getting feedback from our students. Like we've developed the curriculum and there's a lot that we say, oh, we're going to make some changes now. We're going to reshoot this. We're going to do that. Like it's, so it's a lot of work, but it's beautiful work. It's very, very endearing. Like it's very heart based work and it's a lot. And so the, when I say integrity is wanting to deliver the highest quality product for our first cohort as well. Yes. Because they are, they are also not all of them, but some of them, a good chunk of them are going to become faculty and senior faculty as well. Yeah. And they're going to become coaches and teachers within our um, institute as well. And so we're just wanting to do it quote unquote right. Um, and for me personally, it's letting go of that perfectionist, um, you know, lineage that I have in me or that, that perfectionist stream to make sure everything has to be perfect and absolutely right. And so that's been a, that's been a challenge, but I mean, we're getting through it. It's happening. I love it. What's been the biggest kind of surprise that's brought you kind of the most joy that you didn't see when you were kind of archi- when you guys were all architecting this? How quickly, how much of a need there is for this? Ooh. The demand, man. Like, I honestly felt, okay, we're going we're gonna to get some good numbers. But that quick, I mean, we were blown away. We were all blown away. We, we sort of, we, okay, we knew it. Our community really is hungry for this, but we didn't, we didn't know at that level. And that's really beautiful. That's very exciting for what we're creating in the future as well. And the the multiple um, streams of entrance into Elementum, it's not just going to be, hey, this is our full curriculum to be certified as, as a Elementum coach or a master coach, but everything else that we're creating alongside this as well. It's, 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 it's a lot, and I'm excited. Perfect. And then I could say, where can people find you on Instagram to be able to see these dope videos on Wednesdays? <laughs> At Stephanos Safandos, uh, and you can jump on my website at stephanosafandos.com or growwithstephstef.com. Okay, and we'll have all that in the show notes as well if you want to just click on that. I'm so glad we waited till right now. It was such the freaking perfect time. I love yes, you, sir. man. Love you too, brother. Thanks for so showing much. up. Thank you, man.